The closure language was created by Richie Key and was first released in 2007. Since then, the language has seen significant improvements and the current release as of summer 2014 is version 1.6. Before getting into how to use the language, we're first going to discuss what makes Clojure unique. The first thing to understand about Clojure is that it is a dialect of Lisp. Lisp, created back in the 1950s by John McCarthy, was the first language to introduce a host of ideas common in languages today, including first-class functions, garbage collection, and dynamic typing. The original Lisp language wasn't used for very long, but many imitators took its place. Sometime in the late 60s, some of these dialects of Lisp incorporated macros. A macro is a function that takes source code as input and returns source code as output. Before compilation, the macro invocations in your source code get replaced by the source code which they return. With macros, we can remove boilerplate repetition in our code. Now, some non-Lisp languages have their own version of macros, but none have the power of Lisp macros. The C language preprocessor, for example, has macros, but thanks to the complex nature of C syntax, macros in C are tricky to write, not very flexible, and can easily produce broken code. In contrast, Lisp syntax is extremely simple, making macros in Lisp easy to write, quite flexible, and unlikely to introduce mystifying errors. So that's the first appealing thing about Clojure. Like other modern dialects of Lisp, Clojure has a powerful macro system unlike anything found in non-Lisp languages. What really makes Clojure compelling, however, and what sets Clojure apart from all other languages, is Clojure's unique approach to functional programming. In case you're not familiar, let's first explain what functional programming is. Functional programming is a style of programming in contrast to what's called imperative programming. The key distinction between functional and imperative programming is how they treat mutable state. Mutable state, in short, is any kind of data that may change. For example, if a variable can be reassigned new values, that variable is mutable state. If an object's field can be reassigned new values, that object is mutable state. If the elements of an array can be reassigned, that array is mutable state. Any piece of data which is allowed to change is mutable state. In imperative programming, we use mutable state whenever we find it convenient. But in functional programming, we avoid using mutable state as much as possible. The reason to do so is that if a function doesn't use any mutable state, it is then referentially transparent. When a function is referentially transparent, it always does the same work and returns the same value when invoked with the same set of arguments. Such functions are sometimes also called pure, in contrast to impure functions. An impure function might do different things when invoked with the same set of arguments because the function might rely upon mutable state outside the function, such as a global variable. Moreover, an impure function might modify mutable state somewhere, such as a global variable or a field of one of its arguments. The sum effect is that the caller of an impure function must be mindful of more than just what value the function returns because the function might do much more than just return a value. Meanwhile, the author of an impure function must be mindful of how the function's business might affect other parts of code. So this is the key virtue of functional programming. Without mutable state, a function is truly modular because it can be understood entirely in isolation without consideration of how it might affect or be affected by other functions. Now this may sound great, right? But you're probably scratching your head wondering how we can ever get work done without mutable state. Programming without mutable state sounds impossible until you realize that we are still free to create new data. So instead of, say, modifying an existing object, we can create a new copy that is just like the original, but with the modification. Likewise, instead of modifying an existing array, we can create a new copy of that array, which is the same as the original, but with the modification. For example, if you have the list 1, 2, 3, and want to modify the second element to be the value 7, we needn't modify the existing list, but instead can create a copy that has the modification. So we end up with a new list 1, 7, 3. We still have the original unchanged list, but now we also have a new separate list. So, by making modified copies in this manner, we can avoid ever mutating any objects. An obvious objection, however, is that copying lists every time we want to modify them might be unreasonably expensive. If a list has 1 million elements, it would be enormously costly in memory usage and CPU time to copy all 1 million elements any time we want to make a simple change to the list. To solve this problem, Clojure has persistent collections. 
A persistent collection is a collection type where the instances are immutable, but implemented in such a way that allows for efficiently creating modified copies. In brief, the common elements of the original and the copy are shared in memory, and so needn't be copied. For example, if I append an element to a persistent list, the new list shares in memory all the elements of the original list, and so those elements needn't be copied to create the new list. If we exclusively use persistent data structures, all of our data can be immutable, yet still reasonably efficient. That solves one problem of functional programming, but we still have one big sticking point, input and output. Our functional code endeavors to avoid dealing with any mutable state, but the world outside of our program, like files on disk, network resources, user interaction devices like keyboards and displays, all of that stuff is inherently mutable. If your program reads or writes files or draws on the screen, it is inherently dealing with mutable state. Other functional languages, like Haskell and Scala, solve this problem with a special data type called a monad. A monad type encapsulates state changes while appearing stateless to the rest of the program. Arguably, the code inside a monad is not functionally pure, but monads effectively allow us to sneak impure code into the context of pure code. Explaining exactly how monads work is infamously difficult. Fortunately for you, though, Clojure doesn't have monads or any equivalent because, unlike Haskell and Scala, Clojure doesn't try to enforce functional purity. Any closure function may do stateful work, i.e. any closure function may be impure. Just be clear that for your closure code to enjoy the benefits of functional programming, most functions in your closure code should be pure. In truth, functional programming is really about constraining the use of mutable state, not eliminating the use of mutable state entirely. We ultimately need to work with mutable state somewhere in our code for our programs to do anything useful. Rather than force a strict separation between pure code and impure code, Clojure simply leaves it up to the programmer to keep the proportion of impure code to pure code small. So a typical Clojure program is going to have some amount of mutable data. One major difficulty with mutable data is coordinating its use across multiple threads of execution. Threads of execution can easily mess each other up when they share mutable data because one thread might modify the data in a way that the other threads don't anticipate. To address this problem, Clojure provides what it calls reference types. A Clojure reference is like a mutable collection that stores just one element, and the operations that access and replace the element of a reference ensure some kind of coordination across threads. We'll get into the details later, but the gist is that references allow us to synchronize threads without using locks, which are notoriously cumbersome and error-prone. Clojure is intimately connected to Java. Not only does Clojure compile to Java bytecode so as to run on the JVM, every Clojure data type is defined in terms of Java classes. Effectively, code in either language can invoke code of the other. Invoking Java code from Clojure is especially convenient because Clojure has special syntax for doing so. In fact, Clojure makes invoking Java so convenient that Clojure standard library simply defers to the Java libraries for some core functionality. For example, reading and writing files in Clojure is done by simply using the existing Java file classes. Clojure's creator, Rich Hickey, views traditional object-oriented programming with skepticism, and so despite Clojure's close connection to Java, the data types we create in Clojure have no notion of inheritance or encapsulation. The one part of object-oriented programming which Rich Hickey does like is polymorphism, so Clojure does include mechanisms for creating functions that vary their behavior based on the number and types of the arguments provided to a call. The first thing we need to know about reading and writing Clojure is the unique way Lisp source code gets compiled or interpreted. If you've ever worked with complex data in text form, you'll know that it's always best to first convert the text data into an object representation because it's simply easier and less error prone to work with it in that form. This is why compilers and interpreters first convert source code into what's called an AST, an abstract syntax tree, an object representation of the source. What a typical abstract syntax tree looks like is that, say, the text that makes up a function is represented as a function object, and that function object contains statement objects, which are themselves in turn made up of expression objects. In Lisp dialects, the part of the compiler or interpreter which translate the source code to objects is called the reader, and the object form of Lisp source code is not normally called an AST, but rather simply called reader data. What's different about reader data is that whereas an AST represents language constructs like statements and functions, reader data is composed of standard Lisp data types, like numbers, strings, and lists, 
the ordinary stuff that we use in our own Lisp code. Just like JSON data is a hierarchy of arrays and objects nested within arrays and objects, Lisp reader data is composed of lists and maps nested within lists and maps. The part of a Lisp compiler which actually generates running code is called the evaluator. The evaluator converts reader data into running code using a fairly simple set of rules. So, whereas the workings of a traditional compiler or interpreter are usually a black box unknown to you, the programmer, in Lisp, the workings are quite transparent. Effectively, learning how the reader and evaluator process Lisp code is the same as learning how to read and write Lisp. So first, let's look at exactly how Clojure's reader reads Clojure code. First, strings in Clojure are one and the same with Java strings. A closure string is a Java string, and they are written the same way, inside double quote marks, never single quotes. When you use single quotes around a single character, that denotes a Java character, not a string. Integers in closure that fit in Java's long range are Java longs. Otherwise, integers are instances of a type defined by closure called closure.lang.bigint. Floating point values are by default Java doubles, but a number suffixed with a capital M is a Java big decimal. We'll discuss how the various math operations handle these different number types later. In the meantime, you can mostly ignore these differences and just treat numbers like numbers. Closure nil is exactly equivalent to Java null. The name nil is used simply because it is traditional in Lisp. Identifiers in Lisp are called symbols, and they are treated themselves as a kind of value. Think of symbols as like a distinct type of string that isn't surrounded in double quote marks and which may not contain certain characters, such as whitespace characters. A symbol enclosure may be composed of letters of the alphabet and the punctuation marks dot, asterisk, plus sign, exclamation mark, less than, greater than, hyphen, underscore, question mark, and apostrophe, except apostrophe cannot be the first character of the symbol. A symbol may also contain numerals, but may not begin with a numeral, and a symbol may also contain a single forward slash, but not as the first or last character. What Clojure calls a keyword is just like a symbol, but it begins with a colon. Keywords exist in the language mainly because we sometimes want something that's just like a symbol, which is yet distinct from a symbol. Lastly, Clojure has three basic types of collections, lists, vectors, and maps, all of which are persistent. Lists are denoted by parentheses, vectors by square brackets, and maps by curly braces. Closure treats commas like white space, so you can add commas between the elements if you prefer, but commas are never required. A closure list is an ordered collection implemented as a singly linked list. Each element is a node with a value and a link to the next element node. Because of this structure, lists are not well suited for random access of the elements. Vectors are also ordered collections, but a vector's elements are stored as a tree of nodes. As we'll discuss in some detail later, this tree structure allows for relatively efficient random access to the elements, while also enabling the vector to be fully persistent. Lastly, maps are unordered collections of key-value pairs. This map here has two key-value pairs, the key string foo with a value 3, and the key 5 with a value 7. Notice that the keys and values are only distinguished by the keys coming before the values. The keys of maps are most commonly strings, numbers, and keywords, but a key may be any immutable object, even a list, vector, or map. This actually covers nearly all of Clojure's syntax. There are a few special characters we'll introduce later, but they mostly represent conveniences. Consider now this small example of Clojure code. We haven't yet explained how closure data gets translated into running code, but you should be able to parse the reader data. What the reader sees here is a list containing four elements, the symbol defn, the symbol hello world, an empty vector, and another list containing the symbol print, followed by the string hello world. Because closure syntax is free form, we can indent code as we like, but we generally indent the start of nested parentheses. Here, I've added end of line comments with the semicolon character. A semicolon and everything after it on the same line is ignored by the reader. Before we can understand how the evaluator processes reader data, we first must understand two more closure data types, vars and namespaces. A var, short for variable, simply holds a mutable reference to another object. A namespace is a special kind of map in which the keys are symbols and the values are vars. Unlike the other collections, a namespace is mutable, so its key value pairs may change over the course of a program. 
Each namespace in a closure program is known by a unique symbol name, so the namespaces themselves are effectively organized into a global namespace. A program's namespaces may look something like this. Here we have two namespaces, cat and dog. The cat namespace contains just one symbol, mittens, mapped to a var, and the dog namespace contains three symbols, spot, rover, and spike, each mapped to vars. So be clear about the chain of lookups. Each namespace is known by a symbol name, each namespace maps symbols to vars, and each var itself holds a mutable reference to some other object. The standard library namespace closure.core contains nearly 500 functions, including the functions for basic operations like arithmetic. For example, the addition function is stored in a var mapped to the symbol plus sign in the closure.core namespace. Remember that plus sign is a valid closure symbol character. It may seem strange for such functionality to be implemented as functions instead of built-in operators, but it's consistent with keeping the core of the language extremely simple. You might object that basic operations shouldn't incur function call overhead, but the Java Virtual Machine is actually extremely good at aggressively inlining functions, and so most of the time, the function call overhead gets optimized away. Now that we've introduced namespaces, vars, and a few standard functions, we can talk about how the evaluator works. In the simple core evaluation rules, symbols and lists are given special treatment. When a symbol is evaluated, it is resolved to the value of the var associated with that symbol in a namespace. A symbol containing a slash in the middle is fully qualified, meaning the part before the slash specifies the namespace. Here, dog slash cat refers to the var mapped to the symbol cat in the dog namespace. When a symbol contains no slash in the middle, it is resolved to a var of the current namespace. When the closure interpreter starts, closure.core is the current namespace, but a few functions in closure.core can switch the current namespace to something else, such that subsequent evaluation will use that namespace instead. As you might expect, when a symbol doesn't resolve to a matching name in a namespace, the evaluator throws an error. As for lists, the evaluator will first try to treat a list as a function call. This list represents a function call with three arguments. The function that gets invoked is stored in the var resolved from the symbol foo. The arguments are the number 51, the string hello, and the object stored in the var resolved from the symbol bar. There are a few things to be clear about this. When the function call is executed, if the var resolved from the symbol foo does not store a function, an exception will be thrown, because of course we can't invoke something which isn't a function. Also, closure requires a function to be invoked with its expected number of arguments. If the function of foo expects a number of arguments other than three, this call will also trigger an exception. A macro is a special kind of function that is invoked at compile time, not during execution. When the evaluator sees a list beginning with a symbol that maps to a var storing a macro, the list represents a macro call, not a regular function call and so the evaluator will pass the arguments unevaluated, i.e. it will pass the reader data itself. The macro call then should return reader data, which gets inserted in place of the macro call list, and then that new reader data is itself evaluated. So in this example, if foo resolves to a macro, then the symbol bar would not be resolved, but instead just itself passed as a third argument to the function. If the macro then, say, returns a list with three symbols, baz, x, y, this list gets inserted in place of the macro call and then evaluated just like any other list. Assuming baz resolves to a regular function, that function would be called with the resolved values of x and y as arguments. It's perfectly possible, however, for a macro to return a list which is itself another macro call, in which case the process repeats until a non-macro form is returned. When the symbol at the start of a list doesn't resolve to a var before throwing an exception, the evaluator checks if it matches one of the 16 special form names. If so, the list is evaluated with the rules unique to that special form. The special form def creates and modifies var mappings in the current namespace. For this example, if the current namespace has no var mapped to the symbol Alice, this def form will create the var and give it the value 3. Otherwise, this def modifies the existing var to have the value 3. Either way, Alice in the current namespace will henceforth resolve to 3. Here, we store the result of a function call. This call to plus returns the value 12, which is then stored by def in the var mapped to the symbol James in the current namespace. 
Do be clear about evaluation order. The evaluator always works outside in, so the DEF form is evaluated first before the call to PLUS. However, when evaluated, a DEF form in turn evaluates its enclosed expression because it needs the return value. So the call to PLUS here finishes evaluating before the DEF form here finishes evaluating. The FN special form creates and returns a function object. The general form is FN parameters body, where parameters is zero or more symbols, naming the parameters of the function, and body is one or more expressions that run when the function is invoked. Be clear that the function form encloses the parameters in a vector simply to distinguish its parameters from its body. Once the function object is created, there is no vector associated with the parameters. You'll see vectors used this way in a number of special forms and macros because vectors are visually distinct from lists. Closure has no equivalent of a return statement. Instead, a function call always implicitly returns the value of the last expression executed. When the fn form is evaluated, the body expressions get evaluated along with it, but the body expressions are not immediately executed because, of course, a function body should only run when the function is invoked, not when it is created. If a symbol in a function body has the same name as one of the parameters, then it resolves to that parameter. So this example fn form returns a function object which, when invoked, takes three arguments. The parameters x, y, and z are locally bound to the function, and so occurrences of those symbols in the function body resolve to the parameters. The body here calls two functions, foo with the arguments y and z, then bar with the arguments z and x. Neither foo nor bar are locally bound in the function, so those symbols must resolve to vars in the current namespace. When symbols in a function body are resolved in the current namespace, you should think of them as resolving to the vars themselves instead of to the values of those vars. When the vars change their value, the values used in the function change too. So in our example, if we modified the var of symbol foo to reference a different function, future invocations of the function created by this fn form will execute that new function instead of whatever the foo var referenced previously. Arguably, this capacity of functions to effectively change their behavior after definition undermines functional purity. The reason closure works this way, however, and the reason namespaces map symbols to vars instead of map symbols directly to other values, is so that your code can always be updated at runtime. This capacity for so-called monkey patching comes in handy when debugging, and also for live patching running systems. Now, if the last parameter of a function is preceded by the symbol ampersand, then the function takes a variable number of arguments. So this example here is a function that takes two or more arguments. The last parameter, the so-called rest parameter, receives every argument past the second, bundled into an ordered collection. Here, ampersand precedes the only parameter, so the function takes zero or more arguments. Closure is lexically scoped, so when functions are nested inside each other, the symbols are resolved inside out. Here, the interior function has its own parameter called x, so x in the interior function resolves to that parameter, but z in the interior function resolves to the z parameter of the enclosing function. Because enclosing fn forms in a def form is such a common thing to do, Closure provides a macro defn that does the same thing in a more compact form. So these two expressions are equivalent. An if form takes three expressions, starting with a condition expression. When an if is evaluated, the condition is evaluated, and when the condition returns any value other than false or nil, the second expression is evaluated and its value returned from the if. However, when the condition does return false or nil, the third expression is evaluated and its value returned from the if. So here, when Alice returns false or nil, the if evaluates Carol and returns its value. When Alice returns anything else other than false or nil, the if evaluates Bob and returns its value. As a convenience, you can omit the third expression of an if, in which case it will default to nil. The do form consists of a body of statements, which are all evaluated and executed in order. The do form itself returns the value of its last expression. What the do form effectively allows us to do is sneak sequential execution of multiple expressions into a context where only one expression is expected. The most obvious use case is with an if form. Here, when Alice returns something other than false or nil, then we invoke Bob, then Carol, returning the value of Carol from the do, and then in turn from the if. 
While a pure function could have mutable variables and still be pure, mutable local variables tend to make control flow logic harder to understand. Therefore, the variables we create in Clojure are immutable. They cannot be reassigned new values after creation. The let special form creates local variables by binding values to symbols for the duration of a provided body. The general form is let bindings body, where bindings is a series of symbols, each followed by a value expression, and the body is one or more expressions. Like a do form, a let form returns the value of the last expression in its body, and like the parameters of an fn form, the bindings are written in a vector literal to distinguish them from the body. In this example, the value returned by a call to foo is bound to the symbol x, and the value 3 is bound to the symbol y. The body of this let has two expressions, bar yx and baz x. In the body, the symbols x and y resolve to their locally bound values. So our let form here is effectively equivalent to this do form, with the difference that this do form calls foo twice. Like fn forms, let forms are lexically scoped. This means that interior let and fn forms represent interior scopes in which their bindings take precedence over enclosing let and fn forms. Here, within the body of the interior let form, x resolved to its own binding of x rather than to the x of the enclosing let. Because the interior let has no binding for y, y in the interior let resolves to y of the enclosing let. In this example, we have a let form which binds a new function to the symbol x, and the body of this let invokes the function with the argument 3. In the function itself, the single parameter is also named x, and in the body of the function we have another let form that binds 7 to x. So the three uses of x here all refer to a different x. Inside the interior let, x resolves to the value 7. Inside the function but outside the let, x refers to the parameter. And then outside the function in the enclosing let, x resolves to the function itself. In principle, a language doesn't need any equivalent of a while loop or for loop because we can do any kind of iteration with recursive functions. A problem with recursive functions, however, is that each recursive call requires an additional frame on the call stack to store its local variables, and the call stack isn't terribly large, even on modern systems, and so deeply recursive calls will easily lead to stack overflow. Consider, though, that when a function immediately returns the value of a recursive call, a smart compiler or interpreter could simply reuse the stack frame of the current call instead of creating a new one. Because the recursive call is guaranteed to be the last thing done in the function, all of the local variables of that call are no longer needed, and so their memory can be simply reused for the recursive call. This trick is known as tail call elimination, because it only works for recursive calls that are in so-called tail position of a function. While the compilers of some languages will automatically make this optimization, this is not the case in Clojure, thanks to limitations of the Java Virtual Machine. Clojure does, however, let us make tail recursive calls explicitly with the recur special form. The recur special form, which may only be used in tail position, recursively calls the containing function by reusing the stack frame of the current call. Be clear that recur needn't be used directly in the function body, but rather may be nested further down in other forms which have their own bodies, as long as the compiler can ascertain that a recur will only be executed as the last expression of the function, the recur is considered to be in tail position. In this example, each call to foo prints its arguments with the print function of closure.core, and then foo makes a recursive call in which x has a value that is one greater and y has a value that is one lesser. So if we call foo with the values 5 and 2, we will see printed first 5, 2, then 6, 1, then 7, 0, then 8, negative 1, then 9, negative 2, then 10, negative 3, and so on. Because each recursive call adds another frame on the call stack, and because this function makes infinite recursive calls, this function will eventually trigger a stack overflow. We can fix this problem, though, by simply replacing the call with recur. Now each recursive call reuses the same stack frame, and so our function will recursively iterate forever without triggering a stack overflow. Again, be clear that recur may only be used in tail position. This, for example, would be rejected by the evaluator. Now, of course, we generally don't want functions to recursively iterate forever. To prevent infinite recursion, recur should be used conditionally in an if form, like so. 
Here, when x reaches the value 9, the foo function will stop making additional recursive calls. You might not think that the recur is in tail position, but tail position is transitive. Here, the if form is in tail position of the function, and the recur form is in tail position of the if form. Transitively, then, the recur form is in tail position of the function. Last thing to understand about recur, when we have nested functions, a recur form invokes the function in which it is most directly contained. So inside a nested function, we cannot use recur to invoke an enclosing function. The loop special form, just like let, creates local bindings to symbols for the duration of a body. The difference is that, like an fn form, the loop form establishes a recursion point for the recur form. A recur form in tail position of a loop body jumps execution back to the start of the loop, with new values bound to the symbols. Effectively, loop and recur used together allow us to repeatedly iterate over a body of code without the bother of creating one-off functions just for the sake of looping. So here, for example, in the first iteration of the loop, 5 is bound to x and 2 is bound to y, and in each successive iteration, the value of x is incremented and the value of y is decremented until x is no longer less than 9. So this loop will print 5, 2, then 6, 1, then 7, 0, then 8, negative 1, then 9, negative 2, and then in the final iteration, the if will return nil, and so the loop will return nil. We could express the same thing as a function which we immediately invoke, like so. The loop form, however, is less verbose. Now, be clear that local symbol bindings in Clojure are always immutable, so you should think of each symbol binding of a loop as being created anew for each iteration. This subtle distinction matters when we create a function in a loop body. Each iteration of the loop creates a different function object, each seeing different bindings of the enclosing loop. This loop here, for example, creates and returns a vector of functions, each of which prints the value of x for the iteration in which it was created. You should think of each of these function objects as bound to its own immutable value of x, not a single x variable that changes. The quote special form takes just one expression, which it returns unevaluated, meaning it returns lists and symbols as themselves. The lists do not get evaluated as function calls, macro calls, or special forms, and the symbols do not get resolved to vars or local bindings. As we'll see later, the quote form is useful mainly in macros, which are meant to return unevaluated reader data. Some functions, though, expect to receive lists and symbols arguments, so quote is also useful when calling those functions. Here, for example, foo bar passes the value resolved from bar to foo, but if we quote bar, then the symbol bar itself is passed to foo. Likewise here, foo is passed the value returned by the expression bar74, but in the second example, foo is passed a list containing the symbol bar and the numbers 7 and 4. Because quote is used frequently enough in certain contexts, the reader provides special syntax for the quote form. A reader element preceded by a single quote mark is implicitly enclosed in a quote form. The throw special form takes one expression that returns an exception object to throw. The try special form catches exceptions that propagate from its body. Each catch clause of a try specifies a class of exception to catch, a symbol to which to bind the exception object, and a body to execute when that exception is caught. In this example, if the expressions foo or baz propagate an exception of type bad thing, it is caught by the first catch clause. If the expressions propagate an exception of type other bad thing, it is caught by the second catch clause. Just like in Java, a try may end with a finally clause after the catch clauses. Even if an exception propagates out of our try, the finally clause body will always execute as the try's last order of business. When a symbol is resolved to a var in a namespace, it returns the value held by the var. If we want the var object itself, however, we must use the var special form. There aren't many cases where we need the var special form, but it is occasionally useful. The new form returns a new instance of a Java class by invoking its constructor. The class is specified by a symbol matching its name. The dot special form, just a plain period, returns the value of Java object fields and invokes Java methods. To retrieve the value of a static field with the dot form, we write dot class field, where class and field are symbols that match a class and its static field by name. 
For example, this retrieves the value of the static field pi of the class java.lang.math. For retrieving instance fields, we replace the class name symbol with an expression returning an instance. For example, here we return the bar field of the instance foo with dot foo bar. In the second example, the instance is returned from a call to some function ack. At runtime, if these expressions don't return a Java object with a field bar, then these dot forms will throw an exception. If the second element of a dot form is a list, the dot form invokes a Java method. The symbol that starts this list names the method, and the remaining elements are expressions passed as arguments. Here we invoke the static method ATAN of the math class, and then we invoke the instance method bar of some object foo. The set special form assigns the result of an expression to the instance field or static field specified by a dot form. In the first example, we set the value of the static field pi to 3. In the second example, we assign 3 to the field bar of the instance foo. Be clear that the dot form inside set is evaluated in a special way because the specified field of the dot form is being assigned to, not retrieved. If the field we're trying to set is not public or is declared final, the set form will throw an exception. The pi field of java.lang.math is in fact a final field, and so this first set form will throw an exception. Lastly, you can ignore the monitor enter and monitor exit special forms. They are used by the standard library for thread synchronization, but they're not really intended for direct use by closure programmers. Okay, now that we've laid some groundwork, we can show a few practical examples, and we'll start with writing a factorial function. A factorial, if you don't remember, is we take an integer number and we multiply it by every integer up to that integer. So say the factorial of six is six times five times four times three times two times one. And then the factorial of zero is a special case that is one for some reason. The, you'll have to ask a mathematician why that's the case. Anyway, uh, we use factorial as a classic example of a recursive function in programming because it's very neatly recursive. The factorial of 6, for example, is 6 times the factorial of 1 less than 6, the factorial of 5. Uh, and likewise, say, the factorial of 15 is 15 times the factorial of 14. And so here, when we have this factorial function created with a defn form, which, recall, is a macro that's just a convenience for defing a fn form, in this function, we first have a condition that tests well, is n the parameter equal to zero? That's what the equal sign is as an equality test. And if so, if it returns true, then the if form returns one, and so the function returns one. But if n is not equal to zero, then we return the value of this multiplication of n times the factorial of dec n, one less than n. Dec stands for decrement, recall. So dec returns one less than the value of n. Now, there's a problem with this factorial function because it only actually works for integer values up to 20, and anything greater than 20 is going to trigger an exception because it turns out that uh, the factorial of integers, they grow very, very rapidly. So the factorial of 20 is already a very large number, and the factorial of 21 is an even larger number, and it turns out it's so large that it's actually exceeding the capacity of the Java long number type. It's too big to fit in the range. So we get this overflow exception. So how do we fix this? How do we have a factorial function that will work for arguments greater than 20? What we can do is make a very simple change. Instead of the ordinary multiplication function, we'll use asterisk apostrophe, which is a special multiplication function that will accept as argument and returns arbitrary precision numbers. That is numbers of type closure.lang.bigint or .bigdecimal, uh, the two arbitrary precision number types in closure. With that one little change, this factorial big int function will work for values greater than 20. However, for even larger values of n, we'll run into another problem eventually, not numeric overflow, but a stack overflow, because our function here is defined recursively, and so when the value of n is very, very large, we're going to be making that number of recursive calls, and each recursive call is adding another frame on the stack, and past a certain point, you're going to exceed the size of the stack, even on modern systems, which will have stacks of, say, a few megabytes or so. On my system in testing, when I invoke this function with the argument 11,439, that is when I would first get a stack overflow. Uh, on your system, though, it could be something else, because different systems have different size stacks. How do we fix this problem? Well, you may recall that the recur special form allows us to make a recursive call that doesn't consume extra stack space, that just reuses the existing stack. The problem though, the reason we can't use recur here is that the recursive call is not in tail position. Uh, 
and the optimization that recur uses the tail call elimination only works when the recursive call is in tail position. So you can't use recur here. In fact, the compiler won't compile this function. So to fix the stack overflow problem, we need to write a factorial function that doesn't use recursion, that just uses a plain old loop, a loop form. So here this factorial big int loop function does just that. First, we have an if that tests whether or not n is equal to zero, and if so, then the factorial function returns one. In all other cases though, we need to loop. And in this loop, the first iteration, we bind to val and i the value n. And if i is less than or equal to one, then we return val. Otherwise, we're gonna go through another iteration in which val is bound val times one less than i, the deck of i, and i is bound one less than i. So note that effectively i starts out as the value of n and in each iteration it's one less until in the last iteration when i is equal to one then the if condition is going to test true and so it's going to return val the loop is going to in turn return val and the outer if is going to return val and so the function will return val meanwhile in each iteration val will be accumulating the result so if the argument to the function is say five then in the first iteration n has the value five then in the second iteration, it has the value of five times four, 20. And then in the third iteration, it has the value 20 times three, which is 60, and so forth until the last iteration where val has the value 120 because the factorial of five is 120. So there's our working factorial function. For something slightly more interesting, we'll solve the FizzBuzz problem. The FizzBuzz problem, if you're not familiar, is a basic test of rudimentary programming knowledge. The FizzBuzz program, as usually prescribed, is supposed to print the numbers from 1 up to 100, but for numbers which are evenly divisible by 3, we should instead print Fizz. For numbers which are evenly divisible by 5, we should instead print Buzz. And for numbers which are evenly divisible by both 3 and 5, we should print FizzBuzz. In all other cases, we just print the number itself. So you'll see printed one, then two, then fizz, then four, then buzz, then fizz, because six is evenly divisible by three, uh, then seven, then eight, then fizz, because nine is evenly divisible by three, and then buzz, because 10 is evenly divisible by five, and then so forth, all the way up to 100. So to solve the problem, first of course, we obviously need a loop, because we're going to be iterating over the integers from one up to and including 100. And so in our fizzbuzz function here, we have this loop in which i is bound in the first iteration the value one. Uh, and then we have a test if i is less than or equal to 100. Then we do the business of the loop. And at the end, we invoke recur to do another iteration in which i is incremented by one. So ignoring that big if expression and all that complex business there, ignoring that part, the skeleton of the function is just this loop that starts out at one, iterates to two, then three, then four, then five, and so forth, all the way up to and including 100, and then past that at 101, the if tests false, and so we don't call recur again, and that's the end of the function. And the function actually will then return nil, because the if form has no third expression, and so it defaults to nil, it'll, it'll then return nil, the loop in turn will return nil, and so the function will return nil. This function clearly is meant to be impure. It's a function to produce side effects. It's not supposed to return a value really. So it's fine that it returns nil. Uh, in any case, so looking at the complex business, notice that in our if we're using a do form because we want to do this if business, this printing business, and then we're going to do the recur. That's why we need a do form because the if form is expecting one expression, but we, but we want to do two things in succession. That's why we need a do form. So we already explained the recur part, but looking at the if, that effectively what you see there is an if else ladder. It looks a little strange because you're used to seeing the clauses of the an if else ladder lined up at the same margin, but here each time we're indenting in by one extra level. But anyway, starting at the first if, we have that condition, which is a call to and. And is a standard library function which returns true when all of its arguments are true. Otherwise it returns false. Inside the and we have two equality tests with the equal sign. And then inside the equality tests, we are using the rem function, which is short for remainder. So rem i3 returns the remainder of division of i divided by three. So this equality test tests whether or not the remainder of i divided by three is equal to zero. And likewise, the second equality test is testing whether the remainder of i divided by five is equal to zero. And so if both of those things are true, we're going to invoke print line with the argument fizzbuzz. Otherwise, we're going to go on to this other if, 
and we're going to test whether or not i just by itself is evenly divisible by 3. So we're going to call remainder of i and 3 and test whether that result is equal to 0. And if so, then we invoke print line with the argument fizz. Otherwise, we go to the last if where the condition tests whether or not i is evenly divisible by 5. And if so, then we print line buzz. But if that condition tests false, then we go to the default and we print just i, the integer number itself. So we have these four exclusive cases effectively. There's the one case where i is evenly divisible by both 3 and 5, in which case we print fizzbuzz. Then we test whether or not i is just evenly divisible by 3, in which case we print fizz. Then there's the case i is evenly divisible by 5, in which case we print buzz. And then we have our default case where none of those are true, in which case we just print the number i itself. There's one other way of expressing this logic that uses a macro called cond, which I believe is short for conditions or conditional or something like that. In any case, cond is basically the macro form of an if-else ladder. In the cond form, you have any number of pairs of conditions with expressions, such that the conditions are tested top to bottom, and the first one that's true, its expression is executed, and the whole rest of the cond is skipped over, just like an if-else ladder. So here we have a cond where the first condition is that and test, testing whether the remainder of i divided by 3 is equal to 0 and i divided by 5 is equal to 0. And if so, then we print line fizzbuzz uh, and skip over the, everything else. But if it's not true, then we go on to the next condition, which is an equality test of rem i3, 0. And if that's true, then we print line fizz. Otherwise, we go on to the next condition of equal sign rem i5, 0. And if that's true, then we print line buzz. And then finally we get to a default case, here denoted with the keyword else, in which case we just print line i. We actually really don't need this keyword else syntax. Uh, we could just simply have a condition true, and that would serve just as well as the, a default. But the cond form lets you put this else keyword here just to make the intent clearer. We don't really need it, it just kind of looks better. As we discussed earlier, the special thing about Clojure's collection types is that they are fully persistent. This means they are immutable, but implemented in such a way as to allow for efficient creation of modified copies. Before covering the many standard library functions that create these modified copies, let's look at how the collections are structured to enable persistence. The simplest collection type is the list, which is implemented as a singly linked list. Each element of a list is stored in a node with a link to another node, such that a list is a chain of nodes. A list object references the first element node, the so-called head node, and the last element node breaks the chain by having a nil reference. Given this structure, accessing elements of the array is a big O n operation. For example, if we want to access the fourth element of an array, we have to follow the chain from the head until we reach the fourth element. So these lists do not give good performance for random access. Because closure lists are immutable, we never modify the existing nodes. Consider then what we must do to create a copy of the list in which we substitute one new value. To replace the value at index 2, for example, we must create a new node for index 2, which references the existing node at index 3. But because we can't modify what the existing node at index 1 references, we must create a new node for index 1 as well to reference our new node for index 2. And then because we have a new node at index 1, we need a new node at index 0, the first node of the list. So in the best case scenario, we're replacing the head itself and so only need one new node. But in the worst case scenario, we're replacing the last node and therefore must replace every other node along with it. In other words, replacing an element of a list is another big O n operation, both in terms of CPU time and memory usage. As we've already shown, Clojure uses lists at the core of its syntax, but because they don't have great performance characteristics, we typically don't use lists much for actually storing data. For that purpose, we instead mostly use Clojure's other ordered collection type, vectors. Without going into all the details, Vectors are structured as a tree of nodes, with the actual elements stored in the leaf nodes. The vector object itself simply references the head node of the tree. A simple algorithm is used to traverse from the head directly down the chain to an element of a particular index. It works out that looking up an element at a particular index is a big O log n operation, which is much better than big O n. And because each node stores up to 32 child nodes or elements, the lookup operation is actually log base 32n, which in practice makes lookup operations nearly as good as big O1 constant time. 
Now, if we wish to create a modified copy of a vector in which we replace the element at an index, the same traversal algorithm is used to find the chain of nodes from the head down to the leaf node that contains that element. That chain is then copied, and in the copied leaf node, the element is replaced, and a new vector object is created which points to the head of this new chain of nodes. The old vector still exists untouched, and we have a new vector that is just like the old, except for having one different element. To be sure, relative to a simple array, vectors impose overhead costs for basic operations like lookups and replacing elements, but in most cases this overhead is a reasonable price to pay for the large advantages of having an immutable data structure. As for Clojure's hash maps, they use a very similar tree of nodes structure, but traversal for looking up a key value pair is based on a hash of the key. We won't discuss the details here. The Clojure.core namespace contains many functions for working with collections. Here we'll cover the most essential. First, the count function returns the number of elements or key value pairs in a collection. The list question mark function returns true if the argument is a list, otherwise it returns false. Vector question mark returns true if the argument is a vector, otherwise it returns false. And map question mark returns true if the argument is a map, it otherwise returns false. The contains question mark function returns true if the collection contains a specified key or index, and otherwise it returns false. So here for example, the first call to count returns 2 because the map argument has two key value pairs. The second call returns 5 because the vector argument has five elements. The third call also returns 5 because the list argument here has five elements. Notice that we quote the list so that it is not evaluated but instead just passed to count as itself. The first call to contains here returns true because the map argument does have a key which is the number 3. The second call to contains returns false because the map argument does not have a key which is the string high. The third call to contains returns true because the vector does have an index 2, but the fourth call to contains returns false because the vector has no index negative 7. This last call to contains also returns false because contains always returns false for a list argument. Here are four more functions. The const function, short for conjoin, returns a new collection with an added element or key value pair. The asoc function, short for associate, returns a new collection with an added or modified value for a particular key or index. The disoc function, short for dissociate, returns a new map in which a particular key has been removed. And the merge function returns a new map that combines the key value pairs of one or more maps. Looking at some examples, the first call to cons returns a new map just like its map argument, but with the addition of the key value pair specified in the other argument to conj. In the second call, the original map already has a key high, and so conj returns a new map in which the key high has the value 7. For vectors, conj appends the new element to the end, but for lists, conj prepends the new element to the front. So the third call to conj returns a new vector with the value true appended to the end, and the fourth call here returns a new list with the value true prepended to the front. Used on a map, the asoc function is just like conj, except the key and value are passed separately instead of together in a vector. Used on a vector, the asoc function expects an index and a value to put at that index. In this first example, asoc returns a new vector in which the value true replaces the value at index 3. In the second example, the index 5 equals the original vector's count, so asoc returns a vector that is one element longer. In the third example, the index 6 is greater than the original vector's count, and so is considered out of bounds. As the last example shows, a soak does not work on lists, and so will throw an exception when passed a list argument. The first dissoak call here returns a new map that removes the string key high. The second dissoak call returns the original map, because that original map contains no string key by. Despite what you might expect, disoak does not work on vectors and so will throw an exception when passed a vector. The first merge call here has only one map argument and so simply returns the original map. The second merge call returns a new map in which the key value pairs of the second are added to the first, overriding existing values for keys as necessary. Notice that the returned map's key high has the value 7, not 8. The third merge call returns a new map in which the key value pairs of the successive maps are added to the first left to right, overriding existing values for a key as necessary. So notice that the returned map's key, yo, has the value 5, not 4.
Here we have three more collection functions. Get returns the value of a particular key or index in a collection. Pop returns a new collection that omits the first element or key value pair in a collection. Peek returns the element or key value pair that would be removed by pop. So here in the first call to get, the map has the value 8 for the key high. In the second call to get, the map has no key by, and so get returns nil. In the third call to get, the vector has the value 9 at index 2. In the fourth call to get, the vector has no value at index 6, and so we get back nil. The last call to get returns nil because get always returns nil when passed a list. For vectors, pop removes the last element, but for lists, pop removes the first element. Again, this difference stems from the structural differences between vectors and lists. For vectors, it is most efficient to remove a trailing element, but for lists, it is most efficient to remove a leading element. So peak here on this vector returns 11 because pop would remove that element of the vector, and peak on the list here returns 7 because pop would remove that element of the list. Neither pop nor peak work on maps. To understand the remaining essential collection functions, you must first understand sequences. What Clojure calls a sequence is not any particular collection type, but rather an interface, a set of operations implemented by some collections. The first function returns the first element of the collection. Calling first on a sequence of zero elements returns nil. The rest function returns a copy of the sequence with the first element removed. Calling rest on a sequence with no elements or just one element returns an empty sequence. Strictly speaking, only types which implement the Java interface closure.lang.iseq are sequences. However, many collection types which do not implement this interface are considered sequenceable or as we say seekable because they have one or more operations which produce sequences. For many seekable types, we can use the seek function seq to get a sequence of their elements. For example, the map and vector types do not themselves implement iSeq, but calling seek on a map or vector returns a sequence of its elements. This extra step may seem silly, especially for vectors. If we can produce a sequence from a vector, why shouldn't a vector just be its own sequence? To my understanding, the rationale is that the rest operation is intended to return a sequence of its own type, but for efficiency reasons, rest called on a sequence produced from a vector does not return another vector. Instead, rest returns a sequence object that references the original vector, but with an offset such that the sequence starts at an index of the vector other than zero. These sequence objects are cheaper to produce than new vectors, and a core goal of the sequence operations is to allow for quick iteration through all the elements of the sequence. In contrast, list objects are themselves sequences because their implementation allows for very cheap first and rest operations. Rest on a list returns a new list whose head is the second node of the original list. For a map, it's more natural that we don't consider them sequences. When you call the seek function on a map, it returns a sequence of its key value pairs as two element vectors. If we want a sequence of just the keys, we use the keys function, and if we want a sequence of just the values, we use the vowels function. Be clear that items in a hash map have no defined order, so you shouldn't expect the items in the return sequences to be in any particular order. So that's why some collections are themselves sequences, but others are merely seekable. In practice though, the distinction is usually really not that important, because most functions that operate on sequences, including the first and rest functions, actually call seek on their argument. So here, when we use first and rest on a map and vector, we can pass the map and vector directly, rather than call seek on them ourselves. A core purpose of the sequence interface is to enable iteration over collections. Here, for example, we use the special forms loop and recur with the first and rest functions to iterate through every element of a vector. Note that, unlike a conventional iterator, a sequence has no mutable state. Each call to rest returns a new sequence, and every sequence instance is immutable. The name cons comes from old dialects of Lisp, where it was short for construct, as in construct list. Over time, cons became a noun denoting a list-like data structure. In Clojure, a cons is an object that holds a value and references another sequence. The cons function creates a cons, though if the second argument is nil, cons returns a list instead. Here, this first call to cons returns a list with one element 3, but the second call to cons returns a cons, which has the value 4, and references the list 789. 
Calling first on a const returns its held value, and calling rest on a const returns its referenced sequence. Because a const itself is a kind of sequence, consts can reference other consts and thus form a chain. Here we def to z a const with the value 5, which references another const with the value 6, which references a list with one element 3. This is very similar to the chain of nodes that make up a persistent list, but the difference is that list nodes may only link to other list nodes, not sequences. In a chain of consts, the last const might reference some other kind of sequence, such as a list. As we'll see in a moment, this makes consts useful in connection with what are called lazy sequences. A lazy sequence is a sequence type in which the elements are not stored, but rather generated as needed by an encapsulated function. One reason to use lazy sequences is that they effectively defer work. Rather than generating all the values of a sequence up front, we can create a lazy sequence that generates the values only as needed. This spares our code from wasted work when the whole sequence never ends up getting read. Standard library functions generally return lazy sequences instead of non-lazy sequences for this reason. Another reason to use lazy sequences is that they may represent an infinite number of values. Because the values are only generated as needed, they aren't stored in memory, and so we can have a lazy sequence that, say, represents every integer from zero up to infinity. You should be careful when dealing with lazy sequences of infinite length, because any operation that attempts to read the whole sequence will, of course, never succeed, and so effectively hang your program. For example, simply invoking count on an infinite sequence will hang your program because count will attempt to iterate through all the values of the sequence. It's really easy to run afoul of this problem when using the closure command line because the command line prints the result of each expression, and if that result is an infinite lazy sequence or an object that contains an infinite lazy sequence, then printing the result will effectively hang the command line. For creating the most commonly used kinds of lazy sequences, Clojure provides a few convenient functions. The range function returns a lazy sequence of integers that span a specified range. The repeat function returns an infinite lazy sequence that repeats a value. The repeatedly function returns an infinite lazy sequence of values generated by calls to a given function. The iterate function is like repeatedly, but each call to the function takes the previous element as argument and the cycle function returns an infinite lazy sequence that repeats the elements of some other sequence. Looking at some example uses, this call to range with no arguments returns an infinite lazy sequence of the integers from 0 to infinity. The second call returns an infinite lazy sequence that starts at 3 and continues to infinity, and this third call returns a finite lazy sequence that starts at 2 and stops at 10. If we provide three arguments to range, the third argument specifies a step by which to increment. A step of one is the same as the default, but a step of three skips over every two integers. When the step is negative, the range counts down rather than up. The step needn't be an integer, as we see in the last example where the sequence counts up by 0 0.5. As for the repeat function, this first call returns an infinite lazy sequence of nothing but the value 5. The second call returns a finite lazy sequence of the value 5 repeated just three times. The first call to repeatedly here returns an infinite lazy sequence of values created by calling the rand function, which returns a random number between 0, 0.0 and 1.0. The second call returns a finite lazy sequence of just three random numbers. This call to cycle returns an infinite lazy sequence that repeats the elements of the vector ad infinitum. Lastly, this call to iterate returns an infinite lazy sequence in which the first element is the provided value, but then subsequent values are produced by invoking the provided function dec with the previous element. So from the initial value 2 we get 1, then from 1 we get 0, and so forth. To create any possible lazy sequence, we can use the lazy seek macro. The lazy seek macro takes a body which the macro will compile into a function, and this function is expected to return a sequence. Here we assign to x a new lazy sequence whose body simply returns a list of four values. This body is executed the first time we call either first or rest on the lazy sequence, and the returned sequence is then cached for later calls to first or rest. So be clear that the function encapsulated by the lazy sequence only ever runs once. Now, in our trivial example above, the use of a lazy sequence is entirely pointless, because we might as well just use the list directly. To make a useful lazy sequence, we need to define it in a recursive function and use cons.
The zeros function here will return a lazy sequence whose encapsulated function returns a const with the value zero and a reference to another lazy sequence recursively generated by the zeros function. When we call zeros, it returns a lazy sequence, and when we invoke first or rest on that lazy sequence, the body of the lazy sequence runs, generating a const. First and rest called on the lazy sequence returns the first and rest of this const. Because the sequence referenced by the const is itself a lazy sequence the same as our original, calling first after rest will return zero as well. In fact, calling first after any number of rest calls will always return zero. Hence, the lazy sequence returned by zeros is an infinite sequence of zeros. Now, note that we would get the same effect if we swap the call to cons with the call to lazyseq. In this version, the zeros function directly returns a cons, and this cons holds the value zero and references a lazy sequence which recursively generates an identical cons. Either way we do it, both solutions work equally well. Here's another function that produces a lazy sequence called increasing. The increasing function takes a number argument and returns a lazy sequence whose encapsulated function returns a cons with that number value and a reference to the lazy sequence returned by invoking increasing with an argument that is one greater. Effectively, our increasing function returns a lazy sequence that starts at n and increases by one indefinitely. In our example use here, invoking increasing with the argument two creates an infinite sequence of integers that counts up from the value two. If we want lazyseq to return a finite sequence, we simply add a terminating condition to our recursive function, such that at some point the function returns nil instead of another lazy sequence or cons. Here, in this function increasing to 7, when the argument is greater than 7, the function returns nil, so the lazy sequence created by the function terminates with the value 7. The standard library contains many functions for working with sequences. Most of these functions will invoke seek on a seekable argument, so you can generally pass them seekable types, like vectors, without having to explicitly invoke seek yourself. Here we'll describe some of the most essential sequence functions. The next function is like rest, but returns nil for sequences of zero or more elements. The nth function is like get, but works on sequences. The apply function invokes a function with arguments taken from a sequence. The map function returns a lazy sequence produced by invoking a function with arguments from other sequences. The reduce function returns the result of invoking a function on successive pairs of elements in a sequence. And the reductions function returns a lazy sequence of the intermediate values that would be produced by reduce. So looking at some examples, this first call to next returns a sequence of 3, 4, just like rest would, but these second and third calls return nil rather than an empty sequence. This first call to nth works just like get, returning the element index 3 of the vector. Understand, however, that nth requires a linear traversal of the sequence, so when accessing elements of vectors, it is generally much faster to use get instead of nth. The second call to nth demonstrates that, unlike get, nth works on all sequences, not just vectors. The third call to nth demonstrates that, unlike get, nth throws an exception where the index is out of bounds, rather than return nil. In the fourth call, however, we supply a default value to return when the index is out of bounds, so this last call to nth returns the string high. The first call to apply returns the value of the plus function invoked with the elements of the vector as its arguments, and so this call returns 15. The stir function returns the string concatenation of its arguments, and so the second call to apply returns yo ho. In the third call to apply, we pass additional arguments before the sequence, so stir is passed four arguments, hi, by yo, and ho, and so returns the string hi, by yo, ho. This first call to map returns a lazy sequence produced by invoking the plus function, with a single argument taken from each sequence in order until the shortest sequence is exhausted. So the lazy sequence calls plus with the arguments 1 and 7, then 2 and 8, then lastly 3 and 9. This second call to map returns a lazy sequence produced by invoking the multiplication function with the arguments 1, 7, and 3, then lastly 2, 8, and negative 1. This call to reduce returns a single value by applying the plus function to the first two elements of the sequence, then applying it with that result and the third element, then lastly applying it with that result and the fourth element. So it effectively adds 1 to 2 to 3 to 4. 
When called with three arguments, the second argument to reduce is treated as if it is the first element of the sequence. So the second call returns 30. This first call to reductions returns a lazy sequence of the first element of the sequence, and then all the intermediate values of applying the plus function on successive pairs of the sequence. So first 1, then 1 and 2 returning 3, then 3 and 3 returning 6, then lastly 6 and 4 returning 10. The second call to reduction starts with 20, then 20 and 1 returning 21, then 21 and 2 returning 23, then 23 and 3 returning 26, then lastly 26 and 4 returning 30. Looking at yet more sequence functions, the filter function returns a lazy sequence containing the elements of another sequence for which a conditioned function returns true. The remove function is like filter, but returns a sequence with the elements for which the conditioned function returns false rather than true. The take function returns a lazy sequence of the first n elements of a sequence, take last returns a lazy sequence of the last n elements of a sequence, and take nth returns a lazy sequence of every nth element of a sequence. The concat function returns a lazy sequence that concatenates in order the elements of multiple sequences. So looking at examples, this first call to filter uses the even function to select elements from the vector. The even function returns true when its argument is even, so the returned lazy sequence has the values 6, 4, 22, and negative 6. The second call to filter uses the odd function instead, so this call returns a lazy sequence with the values 1, 3, 23, and negative 5. These two calls to remove demonstrate that remove selects the inverse of filter. This call to take returns a lazy sequence of the first three elements of the vector, 1, 3, and 6. The call to take last returns a lazy sequence of the last three elements of the vector, 23, negative 6, and negative 5. The call to take nth returns every third element from the vector, starting with the first, and so returns 1, 4, and negative 6. This call to concat returns a lazy sequence with all the elements of the sequence arguments in order of appearance, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Here are the last six functions we'll discuss for the moment. The interleave function returns a lazy sequence that takes elements from multiple collections round robin. The interpose function returns a lazy sequence in which a value is inserted in between elements of a sequence. The distinct function returns a lazy sequence in which only the first occurrences of any value is retained. The reverse function returns a list of the elements of a sequence in reverse order. The flatten function returns a lazy sequence containing the elements of some other sequence and any nested sequences. And lastly, the sort function returns a non-lazy sequence of the elements of some other sequence in sorted order. So here, this call to interleave returns a lazy sequence of the elements of the sequence arguments in round-robin order until the shortest sequence argument is exhausted. So we get 1, 5, 9, 2, 6, and 10. This call to interpose returns a lazy sequence with the value 3 inserted in between every element of the vector, so we get 7, 3, 8, 3, 9, 3, and 10. This call to distinct returns a lazy sequence that retains only the first occurrence of each value in the vector, so we get 1, 4, 2, and 3. The call to reverse returns a list, not a lazy sequence, of the vector's elements in reverse order, so we get 3, 2, and 1. The flatten function returns a lazy sequence of all the values of the vector in order, even those nested within other vectors. Lastly, the sort function returns a non-lazy sequence of the vector's elements in sorted order. By default, sort uses the compare function to decide what values come before what. The compare function returns negative 1 when its first argument is lesser than its second, plus 1 when its first argument is greater than its second, and 0 when its two arguments are equal. We can customize the sorting behavior of sort by providing a substitute function for compare. This substitute function must either also return negative 1 plus 1 or 0, or otherwise it must return true or false. In this last example, we call sort but provide the greater than function as a substitute for compare. The greater than function returns true when its first argument is greater than its second, and so this call to sort returns the numbers in order of greatest to least value. Code enclosure is organized into namespaces. Each namespace is known by a symbol name, and at any one time during evaluation, one namespace is the current namespace.
Again, this current namespace is the one used by the evaluator when resolving symbols. When the closure runtime starts, the current namespace is a namespace called user, which conveniently contains everything from the standard library's closure.core namespace. So right at program start, a def form will modify the namespace called user, but we can also use the functions and macros of closure.core without having to fully qualify those symbols. The closure.core function in ns, as an in namespace, changes the current namespace. Here we quote the symbol foo to pass it to the in ns function. If the namespace foo doesn't already exist, this call to in ns will create it, and either way foo will henceforth be the current namespace. Be clear that this new namespace is completely blank, and so does not contain the elements of closure.core like the user namespace does. We can get around this by fully qualifying our symbols with a namespace, but that's ugly and inconvenient. There's a better solution once we understand namespaces a little better. A namespace can actually have four different kinds of mappings. Symbols to vars interned, symbol to vars referred, symbols to classes, and symbols to namespaces. Interned mappings are the normal kind of mappings, the ones we create with the def special form. Here, for example, we assign for to a var mapped to the symbol bar, and we use the def and macro to assign a function to a var mapped to the symbol zeros. Referred mappings, though, are created with the refer function. This function takes a symbol naming another namespace, and every interned mapping of that namespace is added as a referred mapping in the current namespace. Here, for each interned mapping in the namespace foo, this call to refer adds a referred mapping in the current namespace. Be clear, refer does not copy referred mappings of the other namespace, only its interned mappings. One way to think about this is that interned mappings are the true members of a namespace, whereas referred mappings are just borrowed from other namespaces for convenience. By using refer, we can conveniently use vars from other namespaces without having to fully qualify their names. Here, before referring the foo namespace, we have to qualify bar of the foo namespace, but then afterwards, we do not have to qualify bar. It is common practice to refer closure.core into the current namespace so that we don't have to write closure.core every time we want to use one of its functions or macros. If a namespace we refer has a mapping of the same name as the current namespace, the refer function will throw an exception. We can get around this by resolving any conflicts in a map after the keyword rename. So this call refers the interned mappings of foo into the current namespace, but it creates a referred mapping called Bob for foo slash Alice and a referred mapping called David for foo slash Carol. In this way, we avoid a name collision if the current namespace already has things called Alice and Carol. Mappings to Java classes are created with the import macro. Here, this call to import maps the Java class java.util.date to a symbol of the same name in the current namespace. And understand that because import is a macro, the symbol argument gets passed unevaluated, so we don't quote it. Mappings to other namespaces are created with the alias function. When the evaluator resolves fully qualified symbols, it looks for the specified namespace in a global table of namespaces, but if not found there, it will also look for a namespace alias in the current namespace. So after we create this alias super, we can use it in place of the full name supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. When we start the closure runtime, we specify one source file to run. In our code, we can then load and run other source files with the load function of closure.core. The load function reads and evaluates the code in a file specified by a path relative to the Java class path. The file is expected to have the extension .clj, but that part is left implicit in the specified path. So this here loads the file bar slash baz.clj relative to the Java class path. By the way, from here on out, we'll always assume that closure.core is referred into the current namespace. A closure lib is a source file located at a path, relative to the Java class path, that corresponds to a symbolic name. For example, a source file stored at richard slash millhouse slash nixon dot clj has the lib name richard dot millhouse dot nixon. By convention, a lib should create a namespace of the same name as the lib itself. A very large lib might create additional namespaces, but this is not a very common thing to do. If a lib source file becomes too large, you might wish to move some of its code into separate files. 
Common practice is to place these other files in the same directory and then use the load function to run them from the main lib file. The require function loads a lib by its symbolic name. This loads the file closure slash java slash io.clj relative to the java class path. When running a source file, the code in that file might change the current namespace, but unlike the load function, require ensures that the current namespace at the end of the call is set to the same namespace as at the start of the call. The require function takes several different options for convenience. We won't go into these options, but here's one example. This example requires the lib closure.java.io, but the imported namespace is known by the symbol bar, not closure.java.io. The use function is like require, but also refers the required lib's namespace into the current namespace. So this here loads closure.java slash io.clj relative to the Java class path, and then it refers the closure.java.io namespace. Rather than use nns require use and import directly, it is most common to use the ns macro, which bundles this functionality together into one macro. A typical lib will start with a single use of ns. The macro has many options, which we won't go into, but here's a simple example. Here, the ns macro switches the current namespace to foo.bar, into which it requires closure.contrib.sql, uses closure.test, and imports java.util.date and java.util.timer. Note that because ns is a macro, we don't quote the symbols which specify the lib and class names. Metadata is data that annotates other data. All closure objects, except numbers, booleans, and strings, can have an associated map of metadata. Metadata is used by a few special forms in standard library macros, and sometimes you'll find attaching metadata to objects useful for your own purposes. We can create a new object with metadata using the withMeta function of closure.core. This call to withMeta returns a new vector with the values 1 and 2, and this new vector has a metadata map with the key soMeta associated with the value true. To get the metadata map of an object, we use the meta function of closure.core. Another way to attach metadata is with the special character caret. When a map is preceded with a caret character, the reader will attach it as metadata to the following reader element. So the map here is not its own reader element, rather this syntax produces one reader element, the vector, and that vector has the map attached to it as its metadata. Some special forms and macros treat elements with metadata in special ways. The def special form, for example, will attach the metadata of its symbol to the var of the def. So when this def form maps the symbol x to a var, it attaches the metadata of the symbol to the var itself. The last thing to understand about metadata is that Clojure's equality test ignores metadata. This equality test returns true because the two vectors are equivalent even though they have different metadata. The term arity refers to the number of arguments expected by a function. Closure functions can actually have multiple bodies as long as each body has a distinguishable arity. Each parameter list and body is written in parentheses. This function here foo has two arities. When called with three arguments, it returns the sum of its arguments, but when called with two arguments, it returns the second argument subtracted from the first. An important limitation is that no two bodies of the function may expect the same number of arguments. This fn form here will trigger an evaluation error because its two bodies both expect the same number of arguments, which would make calls to the function ambiguous. Does a call with three arguments invoke the first definition or the second? There's no way for closure to decide, so it doesn't allow such functions. Also be clear that a rest parameter causes conflicts with any function definition that has an arity of greater length. In this example, the second body expects one or more arguments, so it conflicts with the first body expecting three arguments, because three counts as one or more. The intimidating term destructuring simply refers to a convenience of the forms that create bindings, namely let, loop, and fn. Very commonly, we wish to bind the individual elements of a collection to separate symbols, for example, here I'm binding the first element of the sequence to the symbol x and binding the second element to the symbol y. With destructuring, I can express the same thing more concisely. 
Normally in a binding, the target is a single symbol, but here the target of the binding is a vector with two symbols, x and y. The value of the expression we are binding is expected to mirror this vector, such that the first element of s is bound to x, and the second element is bound to y. As long as s is a seekable type, this works fine. The sequence could even have fewer than two elements, in which case the extra symbols get the value nil. Destructuring also works with maps. Here, the target map has a key symbol x with value keyword x, meaning that the value of the keyword x in the expression we're binding is bound to the symbol x. Frankly, the syntax for map destructuring seems totally backwards to me. It would be much more logical to make the binding targets the values of the destructuring map instead of its keys. The reason Clojure went with the illogical syntax is because certain keywords used as keys of a destructuring map have special meaning in that context. For example, the keyword keys in the destructuring map precedes a vector that lists symbols to bind for keywords of the same name, e.g. the symbol x is bound the value of the keyword x from the provided expression. So, this special syntax spares us from having to write the same words as both symbols and keywords. There are a few other special keywords in destructuring maps, but I won't go into them here. Destructuring maps and vectors can be nested. Here, for example, the target of the binding form is a map with a nested vector. The general idea of destructuring is that the provided expression must mirror the target, as it does here. The value of the keyword x is expected to be a sequence, and its first two elements are bound to the symbols a and b. While the syntax is nice and compact, as you can see, it gets a little cluttery, so I recommend using it with some caution. All the examples I've shown are with the let form, but destructuring also works in the loop and fn forms, as well as the defn macro. In this defn macro, for example, the function expects just one parameter, but that parameter is expected to be a seekable, and the first and second elements of that seekable get bounded to the symbols a and b. A set is a collection type in which all of the elements are always unique. Sets are like maps, but all the keys of a set are their own values. Whereas maps have key value pairs, sets just have keys. Clojure has two primary kinds of sets, hash sets and tree sets. The difference is that hash sets have no sense of order among their elements, but tree sets keep their elements in a sorted order. The hash set function of Clojure.core creates a hash set. This example creates a set of three elements the string high, the number 5, and the number 8. Notice that we supplied the value 8 twice as argument to hash set, but the set only stores one value 8, not 2. Many of the standard collection functions work on sets. For example, conj here returns a set of four elements, high, 11, 5, 8, get s high returns high, and get s 24 returns nil because the set does not contain 24. Somewhat surprisingly, we cannot remove elements with disoak, but instead must use a function called disj, short for disjoint. So this call to disjoint here returns a copy of the set, but without the value 5. To create a tree set, we use the function sorted set. First we def to s a tree set with the values negative 5, 2, 7, and 9 in that order. And if we call first on this set, we get the value negative 5, and then rest returns the sequence 2, 7, and 9. The sorting is done by the compare function, so all of the elements must be numbers. If you want to specify a different sorting function, use sorted set by. Here we use greater than as the compare function. You may recall from earlier that the greater than function sorts numbers from greatest to least because it returns true when its first argument is greater than its second. For convenience and concision, closure collection types are themselves functions. A collection invoked as a function returns the value for the index or key provided as argument. We invoke a vector as a function with the argument 1, and the call returns 5, the value at index 1 of the vector. Here we invoke a map as a function with the argument keyword y, and the call returns 4, the value associated with the keyword y. As a further convenience, keywords can also be called as functions. A keyword called as a function with a map as argument returns the value of the map associated with the keyword. This extra allowance does nothing we couldn't already accomplish, but you may prefer this construction stylistically in certain contexts.
In addition to the apostrophe for the quote form, the closure reader has a few other syntactical conveniences. A list preceded with a number sign is shorthand for an FN form whose body has just one expression. In these shorthand functions, parameters are symbols starting with a percent sign, followed by a number denoting the position of the parameter. For example, here percent sign 2 denotes the second parameter and percent sign 1 denotes the first parameter. Percent sign by itself is the same as percent sign 1. A number sign in front of curly braces is shorthand for a hash set. Somewhat strangely, this set shorthand doesn't accept duplicate arguments. Like quote, the var special form has a shorthand syntax, number sign apostrophe. When the caret symbol precedes a symbol, it is shorthand for a metadata map in which the symbol is associated with a keyword tag. As we'll discuss later, the keyword tag in metadata maps is used by some special forms and macros to convey type information. When the caret symbol precedes a keyword, it is shorthand for a metadata map in which the value true is associated with that keyword. Again, this is convenient for certain special forms and macros, which expect metadata maps of this form. That covers most of the syntactical conveniences, but there are a couple more we'll mention later. So here's our first example of an actual complete running program. This is a simple rock, paper, scissors game that's played at the command line. The player is prompted to enter a choice of either rock, paper, or scissors, and then the computer makes a random guess, and then the program decides who wins and displays that on the console. So here are the first two functions, and I'll start with this top one. This get guess function takes no arguments, and what this function does is it returns a string, a lowercase r, p, or s, depending upon whether the player selects rock, paper, or scissors. Uh, don't mind my misspelling of scissors up there. Uh, anyway, if the player types something other than lowercase r, p, or s, however, uh, then that's invalid input and this function will return nil. So anyway, looking at the first line of the function, we use the print line function and it prints out that string saying play your hand, r for rock, p for paper, and s for scissors. And then we have a let form that binds to guess the value of read line. Read line is a standard library function which will take the console input from whatever the user types and it actually will block the program. Your program will sit and wait while the user types and when they hit enter, then whatever they've typed is returned as a string from this function. So that string they enter gets bound to guess and then in the let body, we have an if where the condition simply tests whether or not the guess they entered is one of these three strings, R, P, or S. And if it is one of these three strings, it'll return true, otherwise it will turn false. When true, this if form will return the guess itself, and so the let will return the guess, and the function in turn will return the guess. Otherwise, when the condition of the if is false, the if will return nil, so the let form returns nil, and then the function returns nil. So just to be clear, looking at this condition, it's a get function with a map of each of the valid strings as keys, each with the associated value true. And so if we look up in this map, the string of guess, if the user's entered string isn't one of those three strings, get will return nil because that key is not found in the map. So that's the get guess function. Looking at this other function, winner, what this one does is it takes a guess from the two players and it returns one when the first player wins or returns two when the second player wins and it returns zero if there's a tie, if both players make the same guess. The guesses are passed to the function in the form of a string of the lowercase character RPRS and first thing that the function does is it has a let form binding to the symbol guesses, a vector of both guess one and guess two. And then in the body of the let we have a cond form, a condition form, where the first condition is testing whether guess one is equal to guess two if so, then the cond returns zero. Otherwise, if guesses is equal to a vector of P then R, then we return one because paper beats rock. Otherwise, if the guesses equals a vector of R then P, then we return two because again, paper beats rock, but this time the second player is the one who played paper. Uh, and likewise through the other cases, rock beats scissors and scissors beats paper. Aside from those two functions, the get, guess, and winner function, we need just one more function, which we call play hand. And what this function does is start with a let form in which it binds to computer guess the result of rand inth with the argument of a vector with the strings r, p, and s. The rand inth function returns a random element from its argument sequence. 
So rand nth will return at random either r, p, or s in the form of a string. The symbol player guess gets bound the returned value of get guess, which again will prompt the user and ask them to input either the string r, p, or s. And if they input anything other than that, then this function will return nil. So player guess might actually be nil. Uh, and then finally, winner is bound the result of a call to the function winner. Notice that when binding in a let form a value to a symbol, we can still use that symbol in the expression and have it resolve to the outer context, not to the context of the let. So winner in the parentheses refers to the function. And to this function, we pass first computer guess, and we pass then player guess. So the computer is player one, and the human player is player two. And notice also here that in this let form, in this expression, we can use the symbols bound from previous bindings. So the order of bindings can actually matter in a let because in subsequent bindings, you can use the symbols that have already been bound. And that comes in quite handy in a few cases, such as this one. So in any case, the, the symbol winner here gets bound the result of the winner function. It should have the value either 0, 1, or 2. Or in the case where player guess was nil, winner will actually also return nil. So anyway, in the body of the let, first we print line the computer guessed and then the value of computer guess, and then we print line you guessed colon and then the value of the player's guess. And then we have a cond form with four mutually exclusive cases. In the first case, if player guess equals nil, then we print line your entry was invalid. Otherwise, when there's the case of, well, does winner equal zero? If so, then we print game tied. If winner equals one, we print computer wins. And if winner equals two, then we print player wins. Again, be clear, it's a cond form, so all those cases are mutually exclusive. So note that our play hand function is clearly an impure function because it's printing output and it's uh, invoking another impure function, the uh, get guess function. So in our first example closure program, we only have actually one pure function. So it's not much of a win for functional programming, I suppose, but in more complex examples, you'll start to see that no, this, this is not the usual case. We, we usually strive to have a majority of pure functions rather than impure functions, but in such a simple program as this, that wasn't the case. The last thing we have in our program after all of our function definitions is we simply have this loop where we over and over again, we just invoke the play hand function. So each time you play a hand, it then plays another hand indefinitely until you just have to control C out of the program. And that is the entirety of rock, paper, scissors played on the command line. It's three fairly simple functions. Okay, so at this point, we've gone over a bunch of standard library collection functions. And we'll put some of them to use here in an example program. Uh, we've previously done rock, paper, scissors on the command line. Here's an implementation of a tic-tac-toe game on the command line. This one's a little bit more substantial. It's 10 functions long instead of just three functions long, but it's still quite simple. So let's walk through it function by function. So here are three of the first four functions. I'll start on the bottom one here, this function triples, which accepts an argument of the board. In our program, we're going to represent the board, the tic-tac-toe board, as a vector of nine elements, where each element of the vector is one of the slots on the board, starting from the top left, and then going to the right, row by row. So the first element of the vector is the top left element of the board. The second element of the vector is the top middle element of the board. The third element of the vector is the top right. And then the fourth element, we go down to the next row, and that's the left slot of the middle row. So we get to the last element of the vector, and that's the bottom right element of our tic-tac-toe board. And in this vector, an empty slot will have the value nil, and an x occupying a slot will be represented as the keyword x, and an o occupying a slot will be represented as keyword o. So in any case, what this triples function does is take our board, our vector of nine elements, and it returns a sequence of the triples of the board, the triples being the rows, columns, and the two diagonals of the board. Ignoring for now the call to concat and list, ignoring that part, look first just at this call to partition all. Uh, this call is where we get the rows, the three rows of our board. The partition all sequence function recall will return a sequence of sequences, each made up of that number of elements, the specified number of elements, in this case three. So it takes the first three elements of board, then the next three elements of board, and then the next three elements of board after that, and so on until it exhausts the entire sequence. And in this case, our board is made up of nine elements, so we get three sequences, each with three values. 
And of course, the first three elements of the board represent the first row, the next three elements of the board represent the, the middle row, and the last three elements of the board represent the last row. Uh, now looking at these calls to take nth, first off we get the first column with take nth three board. The first column is made up of the values at index zero of the board, index three of the board, and index six. And the take nth function will return a sequence made up of the item at index zero, and then it gets the subsequent values by adding three each time until it exhausts a sequence. So we get the values at index zero, three, and six. Now to get the second column, what we want are the values at index one, four, and seven. And we can do that if we first take our board and we drop the first element. So this call to drop one board, that returns a new sequence, which is just like our board vector, except without the first element. So its index zero is index one of the board and so forth. So now when we call take nth three, we're again getting the elements at index zero, three, and six, except now zero, three, and six refer to indexes one, four, and seven of the original board. And then to get the last column, the third column, it's the same idea, we just drop two. So now that uh, what was index two of the board is index zero of this return sequence, which we pass to take nth. Now to get the diagonal, which runs from top left to bottom right, we want the values at index zero, four, and eight. So we can get those values with a call to take nth where the argument is four. But to get the diagonal that runs from top right to bottom left, we want the values at index two, four, and six. And so once again, we drop two from the original board, yielding a sequence that starts at index two. And we could call take nth two on that new sequence uh, and get back the values at two, four, and six, but then we'd also have the value eight, and we don't want that last value. So here, after dropping the first two values of the board, we use the drop last function to drop the last two values of that returned sequence, and we end up with a sequence that runs from the original vectors index two up to index seven. We didn't need to drop last two, we could have just dropped last at one and gotten the same effect, it doesn't matter, really. In any case, we end up with the top right to bottom left diagonal, the indexes two, four, and six of the original board vector. So now you should understand the call to partition all and the calls to take nth. What we need to do now is combine all of these sequences representing the rows, columns, and diagonals into one big sequence of these things. So first we need to take all the individual columns uh, and the diagonals and combine them into one sequence, and a list in this case. And now that we have a list of all that stuff and we have our sequence of the rows, we can combine them together into one big sequence with the concat function. So the concat function will return a sequence of all of our triples, the rows, columns, and the diagonals. And so that's what this triples function will return, the result of concat. So now that we can get a sequence of all these so-called triples of our board, let's look at this top function, triple winner question mark, which is passed in a triple. And if all of the elements of the triple are X's, then it returns an X, a keyword X value. If all the elements are O's, it returns a keyword O. And if it's neither case, if it's a mix of X's or O's or nils, then this triple winner function returns nil. First, looking at the outer if form in this function, its condition is a call to every question mark. And the every question mark function is a sequence function that first takes a predicate, a function that returns either true or false, and then the sequence, in this case, triple. Every will invoke its predicate function once with each element from the sequence. And only if all of these calls to the predicate function return true will the every function return true. Otherwise, if any of the calls to the predicate function return false, then every will return false. So here the predicate function is actually a set. And as we discussed, a set can be invoked like a function. And when you call a set as a function, you pass in some value. And if that value is contained within the set, then the set will return that value. Otherwise it returns nil. Uh, we could instead of this set, we could have a predicate function that takes in a parameter and we test whether that parameter is equal to the value we're looking for, a uh, colon x, a keyword x but this form, as you can see, is more compact to write. So this is the preferred idiom. And so in this condition, this call to every, if all the elements of the triple sequence are the value keyword x, then every invocation of the predicate function here, the set, will return keyword x, which is considered truthy, 
and so the every function will return true. And when this call to every returns true, then this if will return the value keyword x, and so that's what gets returned from the triple winner function. If, however, this condition tests false, if not all the values are equal to keyword x, then we reach this other if form, which has a very similar condition, except now we're testing whether every value in the triple sequence is the value keyword o. And if so, then we return keyword o, otherwise we return nil. So as we said, if all the elements of the triple sequence are the keyword x value, then this function returns keyword x. If all the values are the keyword o value, then this function returns keyword o. And if neither of these cases are true, then this function returns nil. So that's the triple winner function. After that function, you see a use of the declare macro. What declare does is really just def the supplied symbol to the value nil. It would really be the same thing if we just wrote def triples nil. But declare is preferred in this sort of situation because it better conveys our intent. We don't really want to give triples the value nil. We just want to make sure that the symbol triples is present in the current namespace because we happen to define our next function winner question mark before our triples function. And the winner question mark function needs to invoke the triples function even though the triples function hasn't yet been defined when the winner function is compiled. By creating the mapping in the current namespace of the symbol triples to some empty var, the winner function will now at least compile. It won't complain that the symbol triples doesn't resolve to anything, even though if we left the var of triples uh, empty, if we left it as nil, then of course at runtime trying to invoke triples as a function would uh, trigger an exception, because you can't invoke nil of course as a function. So that's what the declare form is for, when we need to make sure that a symbol to var mapping pre-exists for the satisfaction of compiling some function, even though we're not yet ready to define that thing. Now, in this example, we could have simply written the winner function after the triples function and it would have worked just fine. But for other cases, particularly cases of mutual recursion, where you, when you have a function foo and bar that both need to invoke each other, well, one of them has to be compiled first. They can't both be compiled before the other. So you're going to have to pre-declare one of them. So that's the case where pre-declaration is actually strictly necessary. Anyway, let's look at this winner function. What the winner function does is when passed in a board, it will return the keyword x. If x is win, it'll return the keyword o if o is win. And otherwise, it's going to return nil if there's no winner, which doesn't necessarily mean a draw. It just means that there's no winner yet. We have another function later that will determine whether there's a draw. Looking in this function, we have a series of nested calls. Looking at the innermost call, we're invoking the triples function, passing in board. And as we already discussed, the triples function uh, returns a sequence of all the triples of the board. The map function, recall, its first argument is some function to invoke on all the elements of the provided sequence. So the provided sequence here is what gets returned from triples, and we're passing each element of that sequence to the triple winner function, and then the map function itself will return a sequence of all the values returned by triple winner. So now that map is going to be a sequence of elements, all of which are nils, keyword x's, or keyword o's. For our purposes, we want to ignore the nils, so we're going to use the filter function to keep only the x's and the o's. And the filter function is another sequence function whose first argument is a predicate function. And so each element of the sequence returned by map is passed to this predicate function, a set of two values. And for all the elements for which the predicate function returns true, they end up in the sequence returned by filter. So this called a filter returns a sequence that has all the values from map which meet this predicate, which are either the keyword x or the keyword o. And then what filter returns that sequence, we're getting its first value, and that's what we return from winner. So first consider the case where our board has no winner, then the map function here is going to return a sequence of all nils, and we call filter on that, and we get an empty sequence, call first on an empty sequence, and you get the value nil. In the case, though, where one and only one of the triples is made up of all keyword x's, then the map function will return a sequence with just one value, keyword x, and so filter will likewise return the same sequence, and then first will return the sole value of that sequence, the keyword x, and that's what our function is going to return. Same story if our board has one triple and only one triple that's filled in entirely with keyword o's. Our function is going to return keyword o. Oh. 
Now, there could be the case of multiple triples having winners. You could have like one row that's filled entirely with X's and another row that's filled entirely with O's. Such a board could logically exist, but as you'll see elsewhere, we're not going to get there because the first time we get a board that has a winner, we're going to stop the game. So uh, we don't really need to consider such cases. Just be clear, if you did have such a board passed to this winner function, then whether this function returns X or O would just be a matter of looking at the triples function, uh, which one of those rows, columns, or diagonals comes first in the sequence returned by triples. But it's probably best you consider such behavior to be undefined, because again, we really don't care about such cases. We're not supposed to get there. Our board shouldn't get into that state. Anyway, hopefully you now understand these three functions. Looking further on, after the triples function, we define another function called full board question mark, which again takes board as its only argument, and it returns true or false if all of the elements of the board uh, are either X's or O's. In other words, if the board is full. This function is quite simple. Again, we're using the every sequence function with a set as predicate, such that if all the values of the board are found in this set, then every will return true, otherwise it will return false. So if any of the values in our board are neither keyword X's or keyword O's, if they're the value nil, then the full board function will return false. After the full board function, we define another function, print board, which will display a board on the console. And note that this is actually our first impure function. All the previous functions were all pure. They didn't have any side effects. They just took an immutable input value and spit out an immutable output value. Any case, looking at print board, first off, we have a let form in which we are binding to board the result of this call to map, which is taking as its sequence the parameter board. Remember, we can do this in let form. The expression that returns the value we're binding to the symbol can use a symbol of the same name from the surrounding context, and that actually works fine in let. So the board that we're binding to and the board we're taking the value from, the let form knows that they're separate values. In any case, the call to map takes as its predicate a function which we're defining in line. Remember that the number sign paren syntax is just shorthand for an fn form in which the body has just one expression. And the single expression in this fn body is an if form. Inside this if form, you'll notice that we have percent signs, and these percent signs refer implicitly to the first parameter uh, of this shorthand function. That's the other convenience of the shorthand function, is we don't have to explicitly declare parameters. They're just implicitly percent sign one, percent sign two, percent sign three, to refer to the uh, first, second, and third parameters, and, and so forth. With the extra convenience that percent sign by itself is just shorthand for percent sign one. So in this if form, we have a condition expression of keyword question mark. The keyword function returns true if its argument is a keyword. So if the parameter to the function is a keyword, then this condition tests true. And if it is true, this if form executes and returns the result of subs. Subs is a function that returns a substring from a string. And the string from which we're getting a substring here is the returned by the call to stir. Stir takes this argument and returns a string representation, like if you passed stir a number, it returns a string representation of that number. And in this case, the argument is percent sign, it's the parameter of the function, which here will be a key word, and so we're returning a string representation of that key word. And the call to subs, substring, is returning a string of all the characters starting at index 1 of the string. So everything from the second character to the end. So now, in the case that when our predicate function here is passed a keyword x, the condition of the if will test true, and so we will call substring here, subs, with an argument which is a string with two characters, colon x, and substring will return just lowercase x. If though this predicate is passed a value which is not a keyword, the condition will test false, and the if form will return percent sign, it will return just the parameter itself. So this call to map will return a sequence which is just like the board which we passed to it, except all the keywords will be replaced by a string with the same name as the keyword, but without the colon. Like say, keyword X becomes a string that just reads X. So that is the sequence bound to board in this let form. Then in the body of this let form, we call print line three times. And in these calls to print line, we're using the nth function to return the individual values of board. The first call to print line is printing out the top row of the board. The second call to print line is printing out the middle row of the board. 
And the third called the print line is printing out the bottom row of the board. The next function, player name, very simply takes a player name in the form of keyword X or keyword O, which is what we use to denote the players, and returns the string representation of that player name as just the letter X or O, just like we did in the print board function. We take the string representation of the keyword, and then we call subs to get the substring starting at the second character of the string. Next, we have not a function definition, but just a def of some global variable starting board, which as the name implies, is the starting state of our board. Earlier, I believe I said that we represent the empty slots, the unoccupied slots with nil values that I misspoke. It's actually, we represent them with the number indicating the name of the slot. And that's just for the sake of when we print out the board, it's just friendlier to look at uh, numbers representing the slot names rather than a bunch of nils. So that's why it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. After defing the starting board, we then def player sequence, which is given the value returned by cycle with the argument of a vector keyword x, keyword o. The cycle function, recall, returns an infinite lazy sequence that's made up of its sequence argument elements repeated ad infinitum. So this infinite sequence now in the var of the player sequence symbol, it's an infinite sequence that goes keyword x, keyword o, keyword x, keyword o, keyword x, keyword o, uh, on into infinity. As you'll see, we'll iterate through the sequence to go back and forth between the turns of the two players. After player sequence, we then have another function, getMove, which again takes just one argument, the board. And what this getMove function does is it parses the string input that the user enters at the console, makes sure that it is a proper number, and that that number corresponds to an as of yet unoccupied slot on the board, and so is a proper move. If the move is proper, getMove will return the slot number which the user entered. Otherwise, if the input is invalid, getMove will return nil. Looking at the body, first we have a let form to which we are binding a value for the symbol input. Input takes the result of this try form, the body of which uses the Java integer class static method parse int to parse the string returned by read line as an integer. Read line, you may recall from the rock, paper, scissors program, is a function which will uh, block the program until the user enters uh, something at the console and hits enter, and then what they've typed, not including that enter character, the new line character, is returned as a string, and this string is then going to get parsed as an int, and if the string passed to parse int is not a valid integer, it's going to throw an exception. So that's why we have this in a try block. And notice that in our exception handler, in our catch block, that's going to simply return nil because in the case where the user enters something other than an integer, we want input to be bound the value nil. So in the let form, input will be bound either an integer or the value nil. And in the body of the let, we have this if form where we are testing whether or not the value of input is found in board. And we do this using the sum function. Like the every function, sum takes as its first argument a predicate function and then some sequence. Every element of the sequence is passed in turn to this predicate function, and the first time this predicate function returns true, the sum function will return with that value of the sequence. If though none of the calls to the predicate function return true, then sum will return nil. So our condition here will be true when the value of input matches any of the elements of board. And when this condition is true, the if form returns input, otherwise it returns nil. And what the if form returns, that's what the let form returns, and in turn what the function itself returns. So assuming, say, that the user enters the number 3 at the console, and so input is bound to value 3, and say that our board doesn't yet have an x or o in slot 3, well then the board vector should have the number 3 in it, because again, in our starting board, each of the slots is occupied by a number designating the slot. So if slot 3 is unoccupied, then the if condition will be true, and the if will return 3, and so the let form will return 3, and hence the function will return 3. If, however, the slot 3 were already occupied with a keyword x or keyword o, then the condition would test false, and we get back nil. Likewise, if, say, the user entered some non-valid slot number, like 0 or negative 5 or 23, none of those are proper slot numbers, and so the condition again would also test false, and the function would return nil. Okay, we're nearly there. We have two more functions. The next function is takeTurn, which takes two arguments, player and board. 
and board is the usual format. It's a vector of nine values, but player should be a keyword of either X or O because we use those keywords to designate the two players. This take turn function, like the get move function, is impure. It's dealing with side effects. And first thing it does is prompt the user with the text, select your move player X or O by pressing one to nine and hitting enter. Note that print line takes any number of strings as argument, the second of which is the player name returned by the player name function. So after prompting the user, we then go into a loop where in each iteration we need a move. So we call get move passing in the current state of the board. Because get move might return nil indicating an invalid input, we then in the loop have this test with a condition move and if move is not nil, we'll have this call to a soak, but otherwise if move is nil, we execute this do form, which prompts the user with move was invalid, select your move again, player, whatever, which then invokes recur with another call to get move. So as long as the user enters invalid input, they're gonna get prompted to enter another value and this loop will continue iterating. If though the move is valid, then this call to a soak will take the current state of the board and at the index, which is one less than move, because uh, remember these slot names, like say three is actually at index two of the vector. At that index, we want to replace the slot number with the keyword designating the player the keyword X for player X and the keyword O for player O. So that's what this call to a soak does. It returns a modification of the board in which a player has made a move. And so that new vector returned by a soak gets returned by the if, and then in turn returned by the loop, which is then in turn returned by the function. So that's what take turn returns, is a new state of the board. Finally, the last function of our program is the kickoff function, the function we invoke first, play game. In the body, we have this loop for which the first iteration we bind to board, the value of starting board, and we bind to player sequence, the value of the global player sequence. Starting board, recall, is the vector with nine elements, the number is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and player sequence is an infinite sequence that goes keyword X, keyword O, keyword X, keyword O, keyword X, keyword O, ad infinitum. In the body of this loop, we have let, for which we bind to winner, the result of board passed to the winner question mark function, which recall returns keyword X, keyword O, or nil if neither player has yet won. And in the body of this let, we print line current board, and then we use the print board function to actually display the board on the console. And then we have this cond form. The cond form, again, short for conditions, is effectively like an if else ladder. And our first condition here is just the variable winner. And if that is true, if it has the value keyword X or keyword O and rather than the value nil, then we're going to print out player so-and-so wins using the player name function to get a proper string representation of the winner because we don't want to display a colon because it looks ugly. If though winner is not true, if it's nil, then we move on to the next condition, which is a test of whether the board is full or not. If the board is full, then the game is a draw. So we print game is a draw. And then in the default case denoted with the keyword else, we have neither a winner and the game is not yet a draw, so we do another iteration. And so one of the players needs to take a turn. So we call first on player sequence to get either keyword X or keyword O, and we pass that to take turn with the current state of the board. So either player X or O takes a turn, and because in the next iteration we want it to be the other player's turn, we take the rest of player sequence. If player sequence starts with X, then rest of player sequence should start with O, and vice versa. So be clear that in each iteration, we are rebinding the board, a new state of the board in which one of the players has taken a turn and we're binding to player sequence, the rest of the previous player sequence. And so for each iteration, a call to first on player sequence will alternate back and forth between X and O. And so our game will proceed alternating between turns of the two players until either we have a winner or the game is a draw because the board is full. So those are all the functions of our tic-tac-toe game. And last thing, all we need to do is just invoke our kickoff function, play game. So that's what we have here in the last line. As we've briefly discussed earlier, a macro is a special kind of function. When called in our code, a macro takes its arguments as raw reader data, and the reader data returned by the macro call gets inserted in place of the macro call itself. For creating macros, closure.core contains a macro called def macro, 
Here we create a very simple macro called if not. This macro function has two parameters, condition and expression. The list function in its body returns a new list containing its arguments. So this macro returns a list with the symbol if, the value of condition, the value nil, and the value of expression. So this call to the if not macro is passed two unevaluated lists, one starting with a symbol greater than, and then the numbers three and five, and the other list has a symbol print and a string high. And then this macro call returns if greater than three five nil print high. This new list returned from the macro replaces the macro call and is evaluated in its place. Effectively, this if not macro we've created works like an if with one expression after the condition, except if not evaluates the expression when the condition is false rather than true. Now to make if not a more complete opposite of the if special form, it should also work for two expressions after the condition. We can give the macro multiple arities just like we can with a regular function. Here we added an arity with three parameters, where the parameters expression 2 and expression 3 get reversed in the returned if form. So now we can use if not with two expressions that get their position swapped in the returned if form. So this macro call here returns an if form with the same condition, but with the two expressions in reverse position. Though this example if not macro is reductively simple and so not very useful, it does demonstrate the basic pattern of a macro. The macro takes input reader data and somehow transcludes it into some kind of code template. We'll go a little deeper into writing more complex macros, but it's important to make clear that while you should feel comfortable using the macros provided by the language and APIs, you should feel under no obligation to create macros yourself. Macros are for extending and refining the syntax of the base language, which is not something we should be doing in most application programming. As powerful as they can be, macros have two big downsides. First, because macros are written to process source code at compile time, it wouldn't make sense to treat them as values like we do with regular functions. In fact, the evaluator throws an exception if you attempt to use a macro as a value. The second big problem with macros is that, because they can rearrange and supplement code in strange ways, a reader unfamiliar with particular macros will have difficulty reading code that uses them. Every Clojure programmer becomes familiar with the standard library macros as they learn the language, but when code uses many custom macros, even experienced Clojure programmers may get confused. So you should definitely prefer regular functions over macros. Only if you're attempting to extend the language with a library or framework should you seriously consider creating macros yourself. You may have need to generate unique symbols. The GenSim function generates a symbol that ends in a number name that is guaranteed to be generated only once within the run of the program. By default, the number is prefixed with G underscore, but you can specify a different prefix. Here, this call to GenSim with no argument returns some symbol starting with capital G underscore, followed by some integer number that has not been previously generated. GenSim called with this argument string foo returns a symbol starting with the characters FOO, followed by some integer that has not been previously generated. So why would we want to use GenSim? Well, the GenSim function is useful in macros that return forms defining local variables. If a macro returns, say, an fn form that defines a parameter foo, this foo might conflict with another foo defined in the context of where the macro is used. For example, in the second macro call, the argument foo is supposed to resolve to something in the context of the macro call, but because the macro encloses foo in an fn form defining its own local foo, the foo of the call gets erroneously resolved to this local parameter. To fix this, we use GenSim to name the local variable in the form returned from the macro. Now each time we call the macro, it generates a symbol name that isn't used anywhere else in code, assuming that is we don't name any symbols in the format g underscore x, and why would you do that? So any symbol we pass into the macro won't conflict with any symbol created by the macro. If a macro returns a symbol in its reader data that doesn't represent a local binding, that symbol is resolved in the context of where the macro is called. What we generally want, however, is for the return symbols to resolve in the current namespace of where the macro is defined. We can fix this problem simply by fully qualifying every non-local symbol of a returned forms. Here, for example, if the symbol ted in the returned form of this macro is supposed to resolve to ted of the kate namespace, we should fully qualify the symbol. A less cumbersome way to fix this problem, though, is to use what's called syntax quoting. 
Syntax quoting, however, is a little complicated, and we won't be creating our own macros in the rest of this course, so we won't cover syntax quoting here. If you do ever try writing your own macros, though, keep in mind that syntax quoting makes certain macro tasks much easier. The three cornerstones of object-oriented programming are encapsulation, inheritance, and polymorphism, but Clojure, somewhat heretically, forsakes the first two. The types we create in Clojure do not inherit from other types, and all instance fields are directly accessible. Clojure types, however, do embrace polymorphism, and so method calls dispatch to methods of a particular type based on the type of the first argument. To have such polymorphism in Clojure, we use protocols, Clojure's equivalent of Java interfaces. A protocol names a set of method signatures, and types which implement the protocol must implement all of the protocol's methods. Unlike Java classes and interfaces, however, every method of a closure type must be part of a protocol implemented by that type. So if you need an operation that isn't polymorphic across types and so is specific to just one type, you don't create a method but rather just a regular function that simply takes the type as argument. So while closure does allow us to define types that are polymorphically substitutable, it otherwise leans towards a procedural style. To create data types in Clojure, we use def type and def record. The distinction is twofold. First, a type allows for mutable fields, but a record does not. And second, the standard library's map functions work on a record, such that each field is a key value pair. The intention in Clojure is that we use def record for representing application domain data, but use def type for representing data structures. For example, if our application requires an employee entity, we would define an employee with def record. A collection type of some sort, however, we would define with def type. In most application code, it's of course much more common to define application domain data than data structures, so you will probably use def record more frequently than def type. Before we use either def type or def record, let's first look at creating protocols with def protocol. The general form is this In the def protocol macro, you supply a name. The protocol name is a symbol, and by convention, it should begin with a capital letter. The protocol doc string is an optional string describing the protocol, and each method signature has this form. Each of these methods must have at least one parameter list, and each parameter list is expressed as a vector of symbols. The method doc string is an optional string describing the method. So here's what a use of def protocol looks like. This defs the protocol Roger and its two methods, foo and bar, into the current namespace. The foo method is polymorphically overloaded to take either one argument or three arguments, but the bar method takes just one argument. Notice that the first parameter of both methods is by convention called this, because the object which implements this protocol will be passed as the first argument. When we then invoke a method, the method dispatches the call to the method implementation of that type. Now we can use def record, which has this general form. The name is a symbol, which by convention should begin with a capital letter, and the fields are expressed as a vector of symbols. Each spec is a list starting with specification of some protocol, followed by implementations of that protocol's methods. The order in which we write the specs does not matter. Each method in a spec has the form method name parameter list body, and the order in which we write the methods within a spec also does not matter. So putting this all together, here's an example def record. This record Nadine has three fields, X, Y, and Z, and it implements one protocol, Roger. Notice a few things here. First, we have two implementations of foo because that is what the Roger protocol requires. Second, parameter names needn't match between the protocol methods and their implementations. All that matters is that the number of parameters matches. Third, notice in the methods we can reference the fields by name. Of course, though, if you create a local the same name as a field, the field will be inaccessible in that local scope. One subtlety not illustrated here is that the method bodies do not see any variables of enclosing local scope. So if, say, this def record were inside a function, the methods defined inside could not use the parameters of that enclosing scope. Be clear what is getting created here by def record. A new Java class is created and mapped to the symbol Nadine in the current namespace, but def record does not add the implemented methods to the current namespace. Rather, def record simply updates the existing methods of the protocol with new implementations. Also be clear about how we specify the protocols. The def record macro expects the protocol to be specified by a symbol rather than just any arbitrary expression, but the symbol is resolved by the normal evaluation rules. Here, if the Roger protocol were defined in another namespace, 
we'd have to fully qualify its name or refer it into the current namespace. In contrast, the def record macro checks the method names against the signatures in the protocol, so the symbols foo and bar here are not resolved like ordinary symbols. Closure types have no formal notion of constructors. To instantiate a record, we simply use the new special form passing values for each field. So this here, for example, returns a new instance of Nadine, where the field x has a value 3, the field y has the value of the string high, and the field z has the value false. To invoke the methods of Nadine, we invoke the protocol's methods like normal functions, but pass the instance as the first argument. So say, assuming foo here resolves to the method created by def protocol, this invokes that method with the Nadine instance as its first argument, and so invokes Nadine's implementation of foo. To access the fields of a Nadine instance, we can use the dot special form as we would with any other Java instance. This, for example, returns the value of the field x of the instance. As mentioned, records also support the map interface to access their fields, so say we can use the get function to return the same field, though note that this way we specify the field as a keyword. Used on a record, the map functions will normally return a new record of the same type rather than a regular map. For example, this first call to a soak returns a new Nadine instance, not a new map. However, if the desoak function removes one of the fields that make up that record type, then the returned value is a regular map and not an instance of the record. The first desoak here removes a field, so it returns a map, but the second desoak here removes a key that isn't a field, so it returns a Nadine record. Now let's use the def type macro, which has the same basic syntax as def record. The only new thing here is that the k field is designated as mutable by giving the k symbol a metadata map with a key volatile mutable having the value true. We could use the key unsynchronized mutable instead. We won't discuss the distinction here, but it relates to multi threading. Because the k field is mutable, we can use the set special form to assign to it as we do here in the second implementation of foo, where we assign the sum of the parameters a and b to the k field. Mutable fields are actually private to their class, so we cannot access them with the dot special form. Also remember that, unlike records, types do not support the map or sequence interfaces, and so we cannot use the map and sequence functions on instances of a type. Again, the intended purpose of def type is to implement data structures. With data structures, we might need mutable fields for efficiency reasons, and it generally just doesn't make sense to treat their fields as keys of a map. The reify macro returns a one-off instance of an anonymous type with no fields. The syntax for reify is like def type and def record, except without the names or fields. So this here returns a single instance of an anonymous type with no fields that implements the Roger protocol. Unlike a def type or def record, the methods defined in reify may actually access the local bindings of the enclosing context. Here, where we use reify inside a let, the methods defined in reify can use the x bound in the let form. When working with types and records defined in libraries, we may wish to supplement their methods without having to touch the original type definition, either because we'd rather not edit the library source code, or perhaps because we just don't have access to its source. The extend type macro adds additional protocol specs to an existing type or record. Here, we implement methods for the protocols Albert and Philippa on the already existing record type Nadine. Hereafter, we can invoke these methods on all Nadine instances, including those previously created. A limitation of extend type is that we cannot directly refer to the fields of the type we're extending in the new methods. We can, however, simply use the dot operator on the this parameter, though remember that the dot operator cannot retrieve a type's mutable fields. Notice that we implemented a method foo for the Philippa protocol, even though our Nadine record already had foo methods implemented for the Roger protocol. This isn't a problem because the protocols Roger and Philippa create separate foo method objects. These objects just happen to be mapped in their respective namespaces to the same name, but we can deal with this name conflict just as we would for any other kinds of objects. As a matter of style and convenience, we may sometimes prefer to use the misleadingly named extend protocol macro. This macro does not modify an existing protocol, but rather implements the methods of that protocol for one or more previously defined types or records. Here we add method implementations of the Albert protocol to the previously defined record type Nadine and the previously defined type Karen.
Clojure's reference types are its only native mutable data structures. The four reference types are called refs, atoms, agents, and vars. As already explained, vars are the objects mapped to symbols and namespaces, and their intended purpose is to hold the top-level code objects and global variables of our programs. Vars are created and assign new values with a def form and its variants. When we define a top-level function, we shouldn't reassign its var in the normal course of business. However, replacing existing functions is useful when debugging or live patching a system. When we use vars as global variables, in contrast, we of course def these vars new values in the normal course of the program. Vars are Clojure's simplest, most straightforward way to represent mutable state. The problem with defing vars this way, however, is that it does nothing to mitigate the ills of mutable state. As separate parts of code and separate threads of execution all read and write your mutable vars, they can easily get each other confused. That's where the other three reference types come in. Refs, atoms, and agents, unlike vars, impose a degree of discipline in how you update the mutable state which they hold. Before delving into these other reference types, one thing we haven't mentioned yet about vars is that they can be marked as dynamic with metadata. By convention, dynamic vars are mapped to symbols that begin and end with an asterisk. Here, we're defining a dynamic var mapped to the symbol asterisk x asterisk. What a dynamic var does is allow us to apply temporary thread local bindings to it with the binding macro. The provided value is thread local bound to the var for the duration of the body. By thread local, we mean that the assignment is only seen in the thread that executes the binding form. All other threads see the normal value of the var, its so-called root binding. Once the binding form returns, the thread local binding is discarded, and so this thread will see the root binding. Consider this example. Here, the var map to x holds the value 3, and so when the foo function is called, it would normally print 3. In our binding form, however, we give x the thread local binding value 5, and so the call to foo in the binding form body prints 5. If at the same time another thread happens to use the var map to x while the binding form is executed, that other thread would see the root binding 3, or possibly its own thread local binding if it happens to itself reassign x in the binding form. After the binding form returns, the root binding is once again used in this thread, so the last call to foo prints 3. While occasionally useful, you should be very cautious of using dynamic vars in the binding form. Though the effect of a binding form is temporary and neatly confined to one thread, it still does mutate state that may be visible to disparate parts of code, which always has the potential to create hard-to-fix bugs. Let's cover what atoms, agents, and refs have in common. Like vars, these other reference types can be thought of like collections that hold a single value. Here we have an atom with a value 3, an agent with a value 9, and a ref with the initial value negative 7. The deref function returns the currently held value of all these types. Where the three types differ is in how we change their held values. For atoms, we use the function swap, for agents, we use the function sendoff, and for refs, we use the function alter. All three of these functions expect the same arguments, first the reference, then a function, then zero or more arguments for that function. Here in this call to swap, we're updating the value of the atom a with the plus function and the arguments 4 and 1. The plus function is invoked with first the current value of the atom, 3, then the arguments 4 and 1, so it returns 8, 3 plus 4 plus 1, and that is the new value of the atom. For reasons we'll explain shortly, the alter function throws an exception if not invoked inside the body of a call to the dosync macro. What all three of these functions do is give their respective references a new value from what is returned by the supplied function when invoked with the reference's current value as the first argument and the supplied arguments as the remaining values. For example, swap here invokes the plus function with the arguments 3, 4, and 1, so the atom gets the new value 8. The common pattern here is that atoms, agents, and refs have their values updated by provided functions, not by simply providing a new value. The reason for this is that the update is guaranteed to be atomic. If another thread changes the same reference's value during the call to the supplied function, or in the case of refs, during the body of the dosync, then the function or the dosync body will start over with a new value of the reference. For example, if during our call to swap another thread had changed the atom's value to 23, then the swap would run the function again, this time with the value 23 as the first argument. If the atom's value is changed again before the swap completes, it runs the function once more. This happens indefinitely until the swap runs the function without another thread interfering. 
Only then is the return value of the function assigned to the atom. What refs can offer that atoms do not is consistency between multiple references. An atom swap only reruns when the atom itself is modified by another thread. A do sync, in contrast, reruns when any ref that is read or written in its body is modified by another thread. This happens indefinitely until the do sync makes a complete run in which none of the ref values get modified in any other thread. Here, if the refs of either X or Y get modified by some other thread during this do sync body, the do sync will restart with the new values of the refs. Agents differ from atoms in that, whereas the swap function immediately runs its supplied function and returns the new value of the atom, the sendoff function runs its supplied function asynchronously in a thread pool and always immediately returns the agent itself. Because the updates of a single agent are always performed in the same thread, they cannot possibly overlap and so never have to be rerun. Effectively, agents are an optimized alternative to atoms. Because their updates run in a separate thread, the updates won't block other work from getting done, and because their updates never rerun, they don't do wasted work. The big catch, of course, is that because an agent's updates run asynchronously, they're only an acceptable choice when we don't need the updates to happen immediately. Also understand that when multiple threads send off updates to the same agent, the updates will be performed in an interleaved order, so we generally shouldn't be particular about an agent's order of updates. If you deref an agent, it will return the current value whether or not updates on the agent are still pending. If this is unacceptable, we can call the await function, which blocks the current thread until all updates initiated on an agent from the current thread complete. So here, this first call to deref, we can't be certain if it's going to return 9 or 14 because we can't know if the sendoff has completed yet. The second call to deref, though, comes after a call to await, and so we can be certain that it will return 14 and not 9. Though actually it is possible it might return something other than 14 if some other thread has called a sendoff on this agent, which happens to have completed by this call to deref. So we can't say for certain the value will be 14, but we can be certain that the sendoff we called here in this thread has completed. If you find that you always use a wait after updating an agent, you probably should just use an atom instead. In fact, agents are most appropriate in the cases where we don't need a wait at all. The snake game, if you're not familiar, is a game where you control a snake, and you go around and you eat these red apples, and each time you eat an apple, the snake grows longer, and the goal is basically to just make your snake as long as possible without either running into the edges of the screen or running into the body of the snake itself. So here's a version of Snake written in Clojure, which I found on GitHub. The last author was Julian Gamble, but he took it from a few other people's versions of Snake. And I've updated it myself to uh, remove a few bugs and make it a little clearer. So first off in this program, we have the NS macro where we're establishing the namespace examples.snake. And in this namespace, we're importing these Java classes, first uh, from the package java.aut, the classes color and dimension. From javax.swing, we're importing jpanel, jframe, timer, and joption pane. Those are all swing classes. And then from java.aut.event, action listener, key listener, and key event. If you're not familiar with the Swing GUI toolkit, it's an API for creating windowed applications. Don't worry if you're not familiar, we'll just go over what you need. What we're using here isn't terribly complicated. In any case, the, the code here is split into three sections. First, the functional model, the part that's purely functional, then the mutable model, the small portion which is not functionally pure, and then the GUI part, the part which actually deals with drawing on the screen and uh, handling user input. First though, we're just gonna look at the functional model because that's where the actual game logic is implemented. That's the general idea in functional programming. If you're writing a game, is it typically the, the logic of what happens in the game should be expressed mostly in the functional model itself. So our functional model starts out with some definitions of constants uh, using the def form. First off, we have field width and field height. That's in terms of uh, grid units, how wide and how tall is the play area. Then we have point size, which is for each unit of the grid, how many pixels wide and tall is it? Each one is square. Turn milliseconds, that's how often the snake moves in terms of milliseconds. So every 100 milliseconds, the snake makes a discrete step. Uh, win length, that's how long does the snake get before you win the game. Here I've set it to 10, which is quite low. Uh, in a real snake game, the snake needs to get quite large before the game is any challenge at all, because otherwise there's no real danger of running into the body of the snake. Uh, but for now, we just have it set to 10. And then we def to directions, this map of uh, key event constants. Uh, the key event class has uh, VK left, VK right, VK up, and VK down. VK, I think, stands for virtual key, 
basically they just denote the the left right up and down arrow keys on the keyboard and so here we're associating with those directions uh, each a vector uh, a vector of two numbers denoting a direction in terms of uh, unit vectors so for example we associate with left a vector of negative one zero because when the snake moves left it moves one unit in the negative direction of the horizontal axis the x-axis but it doesn't go either up or down so the y coordinate is zero and likewise with the other directions uh, notice that say for up the y-axis runs in the positive direction downwards so negative one on the y-axis is going up by one okay so those are the constants and then we have these two uh, functions create snake and create apple which as the name implies creates our snake and our apple object representation we're not going to use any def type or def record we're just going to use an ad hoc uh, map uh, to represent both of these things the snake and the apples uh, so for example in the create snake function we are returning this map with four key value pairs the keys are keyword body keyword direction keyword type and keyword color the body is represented as simply a list of coordinate vectors where the the first one represents the head uh, the next one represents the thing the the segment after the head and so forth all the way to the tail so this create snake function returns a snake where the head is at coordinate three zero and the tail is at coordinate zero zero where zero zero is the top left of our field of play and then we have the initial direction of the snake the direction it's headed in for its next move that starts out going off to the right so the vector is one zero x increases by one and y stays the same we're giving both the snake and the apple a type keyword because that's what we'll use in a particular method to distinguish between these two types of things uh, as we'll discuss later so that's why that's there to identify that this is the snake map and this is the apple map and lastly in the snake we have for the keyword color we have an instance of the color class notice here we're instantiating this color class with a special syntax uh, there's a special syntax enclosure where a symbol ending with a period at the start of a list is just shorthand really for the new special form so this is the same as new color 15 160 70. and this java.awt.color class it's a it's a representation of a color as a red green and blue value the red here is 15 the green is 160 and the blue is 70. so because the green is predominant this is a mostly green shade but with some element of blue and a small hint of red so that's create snake uh, looking now at create apple this also returns a map this time with the keys location color and type uh, the type of course is set to apple rather than snake in this color notice that red predominates red is the biggest number 210 and so it's a mostly red color and then the location of the apple is another vector it's another coordinate of x and y and x is a random integer value from zero up to but not including the field width and y is a random integer value from zero up to but not including field height so when we create an apple its location is some random place on the field this point to screen rectangle function is taking a point uh, a coordinate of the grid of our field and translating it into a vector of four values which are going to be used by uh, the drawing function to actually draw a rectangle of pixels in the window so we're basically translating from field coordinates to pixel coordinates because when we draw a point on the grid we want to render it not as a single pixel but as a square that is point size pixels 15 pixels we set it to tall and wide so first looking at the parameters of this function notice that we're using destructuring there's a vector with two symbols inside point x and point y so this function is expecting a sequence where the first element gets bound to point x and the second element gets bound to point y the body of this function then returns a vector with four elements first the product of point x and point size then the product of point y and point size and then point size and point size so for example if we pass in a coordinate of the value say three and zero then we get back a vector well uh, point size has a value 15 as we said so three times 15 is 45 uh, zero times 15 is zero and then point size and point size both of those are 15 so we get back 45 0 15 15. Again, this will be used later by a drawing function where the first two values uh, denote a corner of where to draw a rectangle and 15 and 15, that's denoting the, the, the width and height of this rectangle to draw in our window. Next, this move function is what actually moves the snake. It returns a new version of the snake that has an updated list of body coordinates. And this function, as well as using destructuring, this time its first argument is expecting a map. And remember the syntax for this destruction in maps is a little weird, but what that colon keys and then the vector after means is that the map which we pass in 
it should have two keys, body and direction, the values of which we're going to assign in this function to these parameters, body and direction. So body will have the value of the body key of the, the first argument map we pass to move, and direction will have the value of the direction key of the map we pass in as the first argument to move. And then where we have keyword as snake, that keyword as means that the map itself is assigned to the symbol snake. That's a, another convenience of keywords and map destruction, which we didn't cover earlier. Again, the syntax for this is pretty damn weird, but it does make for a nice convenience. In any case, we then also have a rest parameter for this function called grow. So any arguments to this function past the first will get bundled into a sequence and bound to the symbol grow. Otherwise, if we invoke move with just one argument, well then grow will just be a nil sequence. Looking now at the body of this move function, this function returns the result of a soak, which is invoked on the snake map which we pass in, and a soak is giving a new value for its body keyword. And that new body is created with cons, and cons takes two arguments recall, it takes first some value and then a sequence, because a cons recall is a kind of sequence that starts with that value and continues with the specified sequence. So we're returning a new snake where the body is a new cons created from some value in some other sequence. And that first value is going to be the head of our new snake. It needs to be a vector of an X and Y coordinate. And we get that with this let form where we, again, using destructure, we, we take the first from body that returns the head of the previous snake, of the existing snake, and assigns its X value to head X and its Y value to head Y. Uh, and then we take the direction uh, the direction the snake was heading in, and we bind its x value to dir x and its y value to dir y. And this let form returns a new coordinate, a two element uh, vector, where we get the x from head x plus dir x and the y from head y plus dir y. Because logically, every time the snake takes a step, its head is in one position over from where it was in the direction of travel. So that's what we're getting here is the new head from the old head. And once we have the new head, we then need to tack on the rest of the snake. That's what we get with this if special form. The grow parameter of this function is basically just a flag denoting true or false. If true, if the snake is growing with this move, then we want the whole pre-existing body because the new head is being tacked on, but we're not taking up the tail. The tail is staying where it was. Otherwise, if the snake isn't growing, if it's just moving, then we want everything from the body but the last element, but the tail. So the if form here, if grow is true, then it returns body. Otherwise it returns but last body, but last is a sequence function which returns a new sequence with everything but the last element of its argument. So again, the let form here is getting us our new head. The if form is getting us the rest of the snake. And we're consing those two things together and soaking it as the body of a new snake map which is returned by this move function. This turn function takes two parameters, a snake map and a direction vector, and it simply returns a new snake map with an updated direction. This win function also uses destructuring. It expects a snake map and it binds its body value to the symbol body. And if the count of the body is greater than or equal to the win length, well then the game has been won. So it returns true, otherwise it returns false. The head overlaps body function returns true if the head overlaps the body, otherwise it returns false. It takes two arguments, a head vector and a sequence of the rest of the body, and the contains function here will return true if the head is found in the set of the body. The set function, recall, simply takes an existing sequence, here the body, and returns a set with the elements of that sequence. So if the head vector matches any of the vectors in the body, then contains will return true. The head outside bounds function will return true when the head of the snake is outside the field of play. This function takes just one parameter, a head vector, but using destructuring, the x of that head is bound to head x, and the y of that head is bound to head y. And then the function body returns the result of this or, where if any of these conditions are true, then the or returns true, otherwise it returns false. And the conditions are, well, is head x greater than the field width? Then it must be out of bounds. Or is it less than zero? Then we've gone out the left side of the field. If head y is greater than field height, then it's gone below the bottom of the field. And if head y is less than y, then it's gone above the top of the field. Remember that the y-axis on our field, actually, the positive direction is downwards. Next, we have the lose function, which returns true if the game has been lost. Otherwise, it returns false. 
and it takes just one parameter, a snake map, and using destructuring, it takes the value of body of that map, expects it to be a vector, and assigns the first element of that vector to head, and all the remaining elements to body. Notice the use of the ampersand in destructuring. Instead of taking just the second element of the vector and assigning it to body, we're taking all the remaining elements of the vector and assigning them to body as a sequence. So in the body of a lose, we simply call head overlaps body and head outside bounds. And if either of those things returns true, then we've lost the game. And so lose returns true. Lastly, in our functional model, we have the eats function, which returns true if the head of our snake overlaps the apple, because that's when the snake eats. This function takes two parameters, both of which are expected to be maps. The first, a snake map, which using destruction, we take its body element, which should be a vector, and from that vector, we're taking the first element and binding it to head. And then the second parameter to this function should be an apple map, and we're taking its location value and binding it to apple. So we have simply two coordinates, the head coordinate of the snake and the coordinate of the apple's location, and then we do an equality test, and if they're equal, then the snake is eating the apple, and we return true. Looking at our mutable model, we have three functions for our mutable model. Update positions, which moves our snake and our apple. Update direction, which changes the direction of travel for the snake for its next move and reset game, which will put everything back to the starting position. So first off, looking at update positions, we take two arguments, snake and apple. And these actually are not a snake map and an apple map, as you might expect, they're actually refs. The current snake map and the current apple on our field of play, uh, those both are hold in refs for reasons that will become clear later. But because they are in refs, then when we update them, we have to use dosync to both read the values of these refs and also to update them. So here in update positions, we have this do sync macro and inside the body of the do sync, we check if the snake is eating the apple, if the head of the snake is overlapping with the location of the apple. And so we have an if test where the condition is a call to eats. Uh, notice that snake and apple are both preceded with an at symbol. What that is, is closure shorthand syntax for the deref function. Remember that when we deal with the refs, atoms, and agents to get the values held in those things, we have to use the deref function. And this is just a shorthand syntax for that. So anyway, if the snake is eating the apple, then we execute this do form in which we first create a new apple with the create apple function, which creates a new random apple in a random location and we modify the apple ref to hold this new apple, discarding the old apple. We haven't discussed ref set before, but that's what it does. It's a simple function that just gives a ref a new value uh, without having to specify some function to update the value as we do with alter. Alter, recall, we have to supply some function which we want to invoke to update the value of the ref, which is appropriate in some cases, but not others. So here, when we alter snake, we do so with the move function, and notice that we're passing in an argument of keyword grow. That's what gets passed to the grow parameter of the move function, which remember just acts as a flag of either true or false. That grow parameter for this call to move is going to have a value rather than just nil. And so in this call to move, the grow parameter is going to be a non-empty sequence and therefore will test true when we use it as a condition of the if. And so this call to move will grow the snake. It actually really doesn't matter that we pass the keyword grow here. We could have passed true or just some random number or anything really. It doesn't matter because all we really need is for the parameter not to be an empty sequence. Anyway, if our condition here was not true, if the snake is not eating the apple, then we just want to move the snake. We're not going to touch the apple and the snake is not going to grow. So we just update snake with a call to move and no extra argument. Lastly, in this function, after the do sync, we just have the value nil because it's just a matter of style, these impure functions. We're just doing them for side effects. It's, we're not doing them for some return value. So we're just making that explicit by having them return nil. Next, this update direction function is very straightforward. It takes the snake ref and a direction and then updates snake with the new direction using the turn function. And notice that we're calling alter inside do sync because otherwise it throws an exception. That's just the rule of refs. Lastly, we have reset game, which takes the snake ref and the apple ref as arguments. And inside do sync using ref set, it updates the snake and apple refs to have the values returned by create snake and create apple respectively. So that's our mutable model, and now we can lastly look at the actual GUI stuff, the part where we create a window and draw on it and handle the keyboard input.
First off, the fill point function is what actually does our drawing within the window. The fill point function takes three parameters, G, point, and color. Point and color should be pretty self-explanatory. Point is a coordinate on our field, and color is an instance of the java.ot.color class representing some color. G, though, is short for graphics, as in graphics context. And if you've ever worked in a GUI toolkit like Swing, you'll know that a graphics context is basically an object which has methods which, when invoked, will draw within some designated surface, some surface area associated with the graphics context. Once we create our window, it'll become clear where this graphics context comes from, but for now, just take on faith that this graphics context has two functions we're using, set color and fill rect. Set color sets the active color on the graphics context, the color which it will use for its subsequent drawing operations, and then fill rect will draw a filled in rectangle. That's what it stands for. So in the function, first we need to take the point, the coordinate on the field, and translate it into a sequence of four elements, uh, an X pixel coordinate, a Y pixel coordinate, and then a pixel width and pixel height. So that's what point to screen rect returns, and using destructuring in this let form, we bind each of those values to x, y, width, and height. Then we invoke the set color method of the graphics context with the argument color. So we're setting the color to whatever is passed in as color. And then we invoke the fill rect method of the graphics context with the arguments x, y, width, and height. And that will draw a filled in rectangle of the currently set color starting at pixel coordinate x, y, and having the specified width and height. So that's our function which does the actual drawing. What we have next is the use of the macro def multi, which creates what Clojure calls a multi method. A multi method, in short, is a special kind of function which dispatches to some other function. So when we call the multi method, based on the arguments we pass in, it's going to dispatch to some other function. In truth, this is nothing we couldn't do with just ordinary functions, but as you'll see, particularly with more complicated examples, multi methods make this pattern more convenient. So in this case, the def multi macro is defing to the symbol paint, this fn form here, which takes two arguments, uh, ga graphics context and some other object, and then the dispatching function returns the value of the type keyword of the object. So object should be some sort of map object, which has a value for the key keyword type. And it's the value of this dispatching function which determines which particular method we dispatch to with the same arguments. Those methods of the multi-method we create with the def method macro. And so you see here we create two methods for paint. And notice that after the paint symbol, but before the parameter list, we specify a value. And if this value matches the value returned by the dispatch function, then this is the method which gets invoked. So the first method here is invoked when the type of the object is the keyword apple, and the second is invoked when the type of the object is the keyword snake. So in effect, when we invoke the multi-method passing in an object which is an apple, then we're painting an apple, but when we pass in a snake, then we're painting a snake. Looking at the first method, we use destructuring on the second parameter to bind the location and color of the apple to symbols of the same name. And then we invoke fill point with the arguments G, location, and color. So we're painting the single point specified by location in the color specified as color. And then in the second method, the one that paints snakes, using destructuring, we take from the object parameter the keys body and color. And then in the body, using the doSeq macro, which is a macro that iterates through every element of the sequence body here and binds each element of the body sequence to point for each iteration. So effectively, we're iterating through all the points in the body and we're drawing them with the fill point function. In truth, this example probably makes multi methods seem like more trouble than they're worth, but in some more complicated examples, they can be very helpful. Anyway, moving on, next we have this game panel function, which returns a new J panel, which is where we actually draw our game. In Swing, a J panel is not a window itself, but it's an area within a window which we can draw to and also uh, listen for events like keyboard key presses and mouse clicks and so forth. So first off, this game panel function takes three arguments, a J frame object, and then the other two parameters receive refs, which hold the current value of the snake and the current value of the apple. We haven't introduced proxy before. Uh, what it does in short is create a one-off Java instance. So rather than creating a whole Java class and then instantiate it, we just create a one-off instance of an effectively anonymous Java class. 
So a proxy form starts out with two vectors, the first of which specifies the class from which to inherit, and then zero or more interfaces to implement. So this proxy here, we're creating an instance that extends JPanel and implements the action listener and key listener interfaces. And then the second vector of proxy is where we specify arguments to the super constructor, to the JPanel constructor in this case, but we don't need to pass anything to the JPanel constructor, so our vector here is empty. After the two vectors, we then have methods, each in its own pair of parentheses. So first we have a method paint component that has one parameter, g, get preferred size with no parameters, then a method action performed with one parameter, e, key pressed with a parameter, e, key released with one parameter, e, and key typed with one parameter, e. Notice that the bodies of key released and key typed are both empty. The reason we have those methods included is because they are part of the key listener interface, and so we do have to include them even though our versions are not going to do anything. Anyway, looking at the first two methods here, paint component and get preferred size, these are methods of the JPanel class, and we're overriding them in our subclass here, this proxy. Paint component is the method that gets invoked when Swing decides it needs to repaint this panel. A panel is a kind of component. And so Swing will provide G, the graphics context which we need to do the actual painting. So the first thing we do in paint component is use the proxy super macro to invoke the inherited version of paint component, the one we're overriding. And the reason we want to do this is because the inherited paint component will first blank out the whole panel. Every time we draw the new state of the game, we don't want the old state to be lingering around. The result would look totally wrong, of course. Uh, anyway, so after blanking out the canvas, we then use the paint multi method to paint the apple and then the snake. Get preferred size as a method invoked by Swing when it wants to determine how much space the panel needs, or how much space it wants, rather. There are cases where Swing will override the preferred size of a particular component. Uh, in this case, though, because our frame contains just one panel, and that's the entire panel, there aren't really any conflicts that'll arise, and so we'll, we'll get our preferred size. So get preferred size is expected to return a dimension object, we instantiate dimension here, again using this special syntax instead of the new special form. And the dimension constructor expects two arguments, a width and a height. Uh, the width here is the product of field width incremented by one multiplied by point size. And the height is field height incremented by one also multiplied by point size. So recall that our field width is 50, our field height is 30, and point size is 15. So our dimension will end up being 750 pixels wide and 450 pixels tall. The action performed method of the action listener interface, uh, as we'll see in a moment, is going to get invoked uh, every time our game needs to update. The parameter E receives an action performed event object, which we're not actually going to pay attention to. We're just going to ignore it. But it's a required parameter of this method, so that's why we include it. So in the method, first thing we do is invoke update positions, which recall updates to snake and apple refs. And then with the updated value of snake, we test if we've lost the game with the lose function. And if so, then we reset the game with the reset game function. And we invoke the static method show message dialog of the J option pane class, which simply displays a pop-up alert window here with the text you lose. Notice that we pass in the frame, the J frame, because a pop-up dialog has to be associated with an actual window. Pop-up dialogs are actually associated with a window. They're not their own free-floating windows. Anyway, if lose returns false, then well, maybe we won. So we invoke the win function to see if we've won. And if so, then again, we reset the game and we pop up a message dialog, but this one says you win. Lastly, because of all that, because the game state has updated, the repaint method doesn't immediately invoke paint component, but it tells Swing that the component does need a repaint, and so Swing will invoke paint component in short order. Lastly, we have the methods of the key listener interface, and the only one we've implemented to do anything is key pressed. Again, it takes a parameter E representing the event, the key press event, and in this case, we actually care about the event object because what we're going to invoke is get key code method to return the key code of the key that was pressed and we invoke our directions map as a function with the key code as argument, and so we're looking up in the directions map, we're looking up that key code to get the associated value, the direction vector. That vector is bound to the symbol direction by this let form, and then in the body of the let form, if direction is anything other than false or nil, 
which it will be if the key pressed was either left, right, up, or down, in which case we invoke update direction, passing in the snake ref, and this new direction, the one that we got from the key code. So when key pressed is passed a key listener event with a key code of either up, down, left, or right, then we're going to update the direction of our snake. Finally, our last function game is the program kickoff. In the body, we have a let form in which we bind to snake a new ref with the value returned by create snake, and we bind to apple a new ref with the value returned from create apple. We bind to frame a new instance of jframe to the constructor of which we pass a string snake, which is simply the title of the window. Then we bind to panel, the result of calling game panel. And lastly, we bind to timer, a new instance of the timer class to whose constructor we pass turn millisecond, which recall was the value 100, and this new panel. We then invoke two methods on this panel, set focusable with the argument true, and add key listener with the panel itself as argument. We want the panel to be focusable because without focus, a window component cannot receive key events. And when we add the panel itself as a key listener of the panel, then when key events happen on the panel when it has focus, they get dispatched to the panel. So when you have focus on the panel and you hit a key on the keyboard, then the key pressed method of our panel object gets invoked. Next, on our frame object, we invoke four methods. First, add. We're adding the panel to the frame. Without doing this, the panel wouldn't appear in our window. Having then added all the components of the frame, we then invoke pack, which will size and position the elements within the frame. Because newly created JFrames start out not visible, we need to call set visible. To ensure that all the threads used by swing get shut down when we close the window, we set the default close operation to exit on close, a static enumerated value of the JFrame class. And lastly, because once we create a frame, it starts out not visible, we need to set visible to true, otherwise the window won't show up. And then finally, very, very last thing, we need to start our timer with the start method. Once started, the timer will invoke the action performed method of our panel at regular intervals every 100 seconds. That's what a timer does. You pass in a number of milliseconds and some action listener object, and it will invoke its action performed method every number of milliseconds. So that's our kickoff game function, and we start our program by invoking game. Now, before we go, you may be wondering why we used refs in this program. Why did we store the snake and the apple in ref values instead of perhaps just say vars in the current namespace using the def form? That would have worked too. Well, if it were the case that say the methods which paint our panel and the methods which update the snake and apple, if they ran in separate threads, we would definitely want to use refs here. Without refs, our paint method might draw an inconsistent state of the game where, say, the snake has been updated after one move, but the apple has not. And if it were the case that, say, our action listener method, action performed, uh, which is triggered by the timer, and the key pressed method, which is triggered by uh, hitting keys, if those methods ran in separate threads, we would have a danger of inconsistent updates to the snake. You could have a scenario, say, where the user updates the direction of the snake by hitting a key, but if the action performed method is running concurrently, it might undo that update and so a change in the snake's direction could get inappropriately lost. By using refs, we can ensure that methods running in different threads can have consistent views of our snake and our apple. Now, it turns out that the way swing works is that these event handler methods, uh, paint component, get preferred size, action performed, key pressed, all of these methods we're using, they don't run in separate threads, they're all guaranteed to run in one thread. And so this program actually really doesn't need refs. It's good policy, however, when writing closure code to when dealing with global mutable state, like snake and apple here, to always just use refs by default. Because maybe you don't have any concurrency problems now, but going forward you might be introducing multi-threading into your program, and then you're going to want them. And then in certain cases with experience you'll recognize that, oh, I don't actually need a ref, maybe I need an atom, 